Welcome, everybody, to the September 25th City Council Legislative Session. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Fister, do you want to uh, do the roll call? Council President Kinnear. Present. Council Member Bingle. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Mm -hmm. Present. Council Member Ulrich. Present. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Council Member Zapone. Here. Let the record re reflect that all council members are present. Thank you. Uh, we are at capacity. If you can find a seat, please find one. Otherwise, you'll need to step out into the Chase Gallery, and we will have sound on there, out there for you, so you'll be able to listen but you cannot stand along the sides or in the back. You need to take a seat or be out in the um, gallery. Thank you. All right. Do we have poetry at the podium? No poetry. No poetry. All right, we do have, um, did you want to do a short video first? Let's invite the mayor down. Should continue. Mayor, are you back there? Shima Proclamation. Mayor, you want to come down? play the video to start. Our community is deeply impacted by the passing of Jeff Thomas Sorry. and his contributions to mental health in the state I will clear the room if there's any more outburst. Thank you. Go ahead. Our community is deeply impacted by the passing of Jeff Thomas and his contributions to mental health in the Spokane region. Jeff was a wonderful person. I am better for knowing him. And he inspired all of us to be passionate about supporting behavioral health resources. Jeff Thomas was a vanguard. Jeff was someone that was really the first in our region to recognize the value of someone's mental health. Jeff was a tireless advocate for providing mental health care to the most marginalized in our community. Jeff's ability to be able to see that vision of what needed to be in place was something just a privilege to be a part of. He often said that it was our responsibility at Frontier Behavioral Health to treat clients with respect and kindness in order to help them navigate the challenges in their lives. This is Mental Health Awareness Week, so let's honor the heroes in mental health in Spokane by doing our part. Reduce stigmas by sharing your story and supporting others. Call 988 when you or someone you know is in crisis. Volunteer, advocate, or donate to support mental health resources in Spokane. Thank you, and take good care of yourself and others. And you want to read the proclamation? Yes, thank you so much, um, Council President and Council Members. I'm also joined by um, Jeff Thomas's wife, Reggie, and his daughter, Chessie, along with Frontier Behavioral Health employees and members of my mental health task force in which Jeff served. And um, this is a special time for all of us to be able to honor a pillar in our community. So. Whereas mental health is part of everyone's overall health and well-being, and mental illnesses are pre prevalent in our city, state, and nation, one in five people may suffer from some form of mental illness. And through education about good mental health resources in our community and our behavioral health workforce, individuals have the opportunity to seek help. And whereas the behavioral health professional workforce is a valuable part of our community, an integral part of the mental health work that takes place each and every day, and mental health professionals work hard to help members of our community in many ways, often in challenging circumstances and without the thanks and gratitude they deserve. Whereas there is a statewide shortage in the mental health workforce and without a robust, skilled behavioral health workforce, we cannot adequately serve those who need their services the most. And whereas Jeff Thomas and Frontier Behavioral Health have been a steadfast advocate for our community's behavioral health workforce, to ensure the sustainability of the great work that Frontier Behavioral Health and other providers in our area do every day and on the Mayor's Mental Health Task Force. Jeff Thomas was a crucial voice for our community's behavioral health workforce and those they serve. Whereas it is 
with heavy hearts that we remember and honor the life of Jeff Thomas, a beloved community member who was an integral part of Frontier Behavioral Health since 2012. And now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, and in honor of Jeff Thomas, do hereby proclaim September 25th through 29th, 2023, as Mental Health Awareness Week, and acknowledge and appreciate the dedication of the mental health professionals in our community. And now I'd like to give this proclamation to Jeff's wife. And Mayor, do any of the family want to speak? I think so. I just wanted to say um, thank you for this. Um, it really means a lot to Chessie, my daughter and I, and Frontier Behavioral Health. And I think that Scott uh, would like to say a few words on behalf of Frontier. My name is Scott Crawford. I'm with the Board of Directors for Frontier Behavioral Health. And we just wrote down a few words. Uh, to be lucky enough to know Jeff was to know someone who was truly special. Jeff Thomas, longtime CEO of Frontier Behavioral Health and Spokane Mental Health before it, was able to glide effortlessly from compassionate caretaker of each employee, new and senior, to a visionary leader deftly guiding the organization through the oft times rough waters of modern behavioral health care, all the while laser focused on the greater needs of the community. As a member of the Board of Directors of Frontier Behavioral Health, I was able to experience firsthand the numerous strengths, capabilities, and insights of our gifted CEO as he set the standard and then showed the way forward. I was most impressed during a meeting, I would see him move effortlessly from caring for the individual to the group, to the organization, and back to the individual again without missing a beat. To say that Jeff Thomas was one in a million just doesn't seem to hit the mark. His leadership and vision for Frontier Behavioral Health, our city, our county, our region, and the state were without equal. Jeff, you will be sorely missed, and yet you have left us in a strong position to continue our way forward, serving our behavioral health community with energy, passion, and direction. Thank you for your many years of tireless service. We are in your debt. Thank you, Council. Now we can clap. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to open forum, but before we do, let me just remind you all of the rules. Some of you haven't been here before. And we do have a two minute time limit. The timer is right here. It's so small, it's almost an eye chart. I apologize for that. Next year, we'll be getting a bigger one, I hope. I won't be here. And three minutes for other items. And three happen. minutes for other items, thank you. Uh, just a reminder of the rules no clapping, no cheering. No booing, no public outbursts. And again, it is a two-minute time limit for open forum. And we want to remember this is a limited open forum, so there are rules. All matters discussed in the open forum shall relate to the affairs of the city. And most importantly, it is the consistent duty of each council member to treat each other, city staff, board, and commission appointees, and the public with respect. Likewise, all persons who attend a council meeting or interact with council members or council staff in any type of forum or communication must act respectfully toward all persons. All right, first up, we have uh, more people than we can accommodate for open forum. So some folks who have spoken before this month are not going to get to speak tonight. First up is, and let's have you come to the front, Terry Hill, Riker Morgan, and Brianna.
Terry Hill is first. I shouldn't let old grandpa come first. <laughs> Terry Hill, longtime Spokane resident. In less than a week, we'll be flipping our calendars over to October. With a local election in early November, that makes October the mudslinging event, the mudslinging month. For candidates with little knowledge and no solutions, attempt to muddy up the attempt to muddy up the situation by, by depicting their opponents as untrustworthy, as members of secret organizations that have hidden agendas. Mudslinging does very little to solve the budget crisis that we face at the end of this year. It does little to move un the unhoused into affordable housing. It does little to solve the fentanyl crisis that debilitates and even kills so many members of our community. It does little to address the mental health issues that the mayor spoke of earlier and plague so many of our citizens. And it does little to cut, uh, to curb the drive-by shootings happening in our city on a daily basis. Our city is in a depth, our city is in a crisis. We need leadership, not mudslinging. When the ballots arrive within the next couple of weeks, well, in mid-October when ballots arrive, take a good look at the, the, the mudslinging ads. Not so much for their content, but who's funding them. Know your candidates well, know their backers even better. With that, I yield the podium. Thank you. Riker Morgan, Brianna, and then Holly. Okay. It won't stay there, but it'll pick him up anyway. Hi, my name is Riker Morgan, and I'm 11 years old, and I used to volunteer at Scraps with my mom until she was fired for speaking out about the killing of Amelia. But today, I want to talk about the 14 dogs who were killed unjustly. I knew some of these dogs. I used to give them treats and talk to them. They would always sit for me and know to gently take the treat from my hand. Sorry, Council President, point of order. Yes. We, we have this on our, on our agenda today, and I want to hear what he has to say, but I think that we might run into that a couple times tonight, and we okay. should be consistent. So, uh, Riker, would you mind waiting until we have that agenda item on and then coming up to speak? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brianna, Hallie, and then Bria. Did you say Bria too? Yeah. I, I said Brianna, and then I've got a Hallie, and then a Bria. Which one am I? Because I'm. That's. Did you sign up twice? Y n no. Well, I've got two names here. Brianna was Riker's mom, I believe. That okay, sorry. As well. Oh, okay. So that then Hallie, Bria, and Kel. Oh, I am nervous, but this is appropriate for uh, the focus on behavioral health. Hello, council members. My name is Hallie Birchnell, ED of Compassionate Addiction Treatment. CAT was founded due to, the, mm -hmm. due to the belief within our community that people experiencing homelessness don't want help, while my experience working as a navigator out on the streets was just the opposite. This last week, I heard these words again or actually two weeks now, Mayor Nadine Woodward and others held a surprise press conference in the corner of our parking lot. Chief Mydell stated, so far, out of all the people we have contacted down here, absolutely none of them have wanted resources or assistance. Last Monday, our team checked the jail roster and identified that we had, have at least met 128 of the folks who are currently in the county jail. Of those, approximately 40 folks are actively engaged in one or more services with us. I'm sharing this to show that people do want help. It matters who is asking and in what way they are being engaged. Our team office often works with officers Plunkett and others from the behavioral health team. Working with them has shown us how impactful it can be when we collaborate to support folks. 
We agree with our mayor that everyone deserves a safe place to live. We know of the 128 people we know currently in jail, Trent has 13 beds available. We, this was last week's data. We need to care about our public safety. This includes all of the public, not just those with the privilege of having a roof over their head and a door to close at night. We are here to be part of the solution. Today, we, ask, we are here to ask our community for support, support in doing this important and impactful work, support in helping our community members experiencing homelessness, support in providing a culturally relevant model of service for folks living unsheltered, support in being included in our community with our city, its administration, and those that have the power to impact us in both positive and negative ways. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Uh, Bria, Kel, and then James. All right, Brianna Gorder, Cliff Cannon Neighborhood. Um, I stand before you to shed light on a series of troubling events involving one of our police detectives, badge number 1290, that demands your attention. It is essential that we examine these events meticulously as they raise significant concerns about police accountability, department policy violations, constitutional rights infringements, and questionable action. Detective 1290 was involved in an investigation with SIU concerning a stolen Toyota. Despite having probable cause, Detective 1290 failed to arrest the suspect <clears throat> and violated department policy 344.6 by failing to file the necessary documentation on the case. In fact, according to affidavits, his documentation was not submitted until the day after a fatal car crash occurred involving the suspect. The suspect in this case was cooperative, admitted fault, and told Detective 1290 that he would leave without being arrested. Detective 1290 placed a Star Chase tracking device on a separate stolen Subaru. Placing the tracking device on the stolen vehicle without an emergency situation was a violation of Spokane Police Department's policy 314.7.6. It raises concerns about whether the suspect's constitutional rights were violated in the process. It is crucial to emphasize that the acquisition of the char Star Chase tracking device may itself be a potential violation of Spokane Municipal Code 18.04.010 since it was purchased by the Spokane Police Department without evidence of the city council's approval. Subsequently, Detective 1290 and a fellow officer tracked the stolen vehicle for over 24 hours but failed to make an arrest, despite having probable cause multiple times. Detective 1290 coordinated with eight undercover Spokane police vehicles in the Spokane Valley, believing they were pursuing an entirely different suspect. This gross misidentification led to the Detective 1290 advising fellow officers to stand down and not attempt to apprehend the actual suspect. Moreover, Detective 1290's statements do not align with the statements made by other officers, particularly regarding the alleged stolen license plates that supposedly gave him probable cause to trespass and place a warrant without a tracking device, or place a tracking device without a warrant. Your time it, is up. That was Sorry, it. Sorry, thank you. Look at that. It goes quick. Okay, and then Kel, James, James Leite, and James Duncan. Good evening, council members. My name is Kel Eddings. I'm the operations manager of Compassionate Addiction Treatment. And I'm here to talk about um, what happened in our parking lot two weeks ago. So two weeks ago, while listening to Mayor Nadine Woodward and others at their surprise press conference in the corner of our parking lot, on more than one occasion, I heard Mayor Woodward say anyone that didn't want help would be arrested, charged, and booked. They would be held accountable for their crimes. She also stated, everyone deserves housing. I'd like to state that each time a person is arrested, charged, and booked in jail, it decreases the likelihood they will receive housing and or employment when they exit jail, in turn making it harder to exit homelessness. We need to provide adequate housing for everyone and stop charging people for simply existing. As a community, we need to work together and do better. Thank you. Thank you. James, then James, then Bobby. Good evening, my name is James Leedy. I'm calling for the Spokane Police Department to be investigated. The Spokane City Council needs to, to request a patterns and practice investigation by the Department of Justice. The Spokane Pat Patrol anti-crime team known as PAC had to be disbanded December of 2021 after the U.S. District Court Judge Peterson noted dis noticed discrepancies between PAC officers 
notes and their official reports regarding a drug deal. But was the PAC disbanded or just renamed? By April of 2022, SPD created the Violent Crimes Task Force. Some members of the Violent Crimes Task Force were members of the PAC. On top of that, members of spe the Special Investigations Unit were on the PAC and now continue to work together with the new Violent Crimes Task Force. An example of this would be the investigation that Detective 1290 was involved in on March 30th, 2023. During this investigation, there was an epidemic of civil rights violations that included using surveillance devices without proper warrant, trespassing without a warrant, tampering with evidence without a warrant, and the removal of evidence from the SPD property facility without a warrant. During this investigation, these officers put the public at great risk despite having multiple opportunities to step in and apprehend the suspect. At one point, Detective 1290 ordered officers not to intervene. Because Detective 1290 made the choice to not arrest the suspect, given the many opportunities he had to do so, one person died, two people were severely injured, a third person had minor injuries, and hundreds of people were put at great risk. At minimum, Detective 1290, as well as other officers, should be charged with involuntary manslaughter. Ideally, a patterns and practice investigation should be ordered as well. Thank you. Thank you. And James Duncan, Bobby, and then Kevin. Hello, James Duncan. Um, before I talk, I want to ask a question, if I may. I may have signed up into the wrong area. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the accusations of white nationalism towards the Let Us Worship event. Is this the right time no, to do that? No, no, we'll sign okay, you up Okay, then I'd that. like to go ahead and talk about something else, if I as may. As long as it's not on the agenda, yes, go Okay, ahead. it's not on the agenda. What I want to talk about is, um, you know, Christians have been persecuted for a long time, so it's no big deal. Um, it happens. So that's not the complaint. The complaint is, you know, uh, some of you, some of you criticize, point fingers, and you don't even spend a day in the life. You, you, don't, you don't come to our churches. You don't see what we do. You don't see that we are involved in our community. We feed our community. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, by the way, I think you all need to know. And if you do know, and you're not talking about that, shame on you. You need to talk about the good that's being done. All this mud slinging, all this nasty stuff, it's so old. It's so boring. I mean, really? Is that all you guys want to do? I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe come to, I don't know, Family of Faith would be a great place for you to come. Come on a Tuesday. See what happens there. It's called a food bank. Great things happen. We get to fellowship with people. We get to maybe minister to them. We definitely get to give them food. But I, I could go on and on forever because I am passionate about my beliefs, and I always will be. They won't be changed. But um, I just want to thank you for letting me at least say something. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Bobby Lee and Kevin and then Dennis. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be here and speak. This is my first time speaking, so forgive me if I'm shaky. Um, my name is Bobby Lee. I am the supervisor of the Medicaid Assisted Treatment Program at Compassionate Addiction Treatment. Um, I work with the unhoused community and have for the past five years. During that time, I have built trust with these community members, and I can assure you in direct contrast to the claims made during the press conference held in our parking lot, most people I work with do want services. As a person with lived experience, I used to live with these people on the street many years ago. I'm in recovery and I've changed my life. Not because I had somebody help me here in the city of Spokane, because I, was, I had doors shut in my face time in many times. By making it illegal to sleep outside, illegal to even sit on the sidewalk or hang out in parks, they have essentially made it illegal to be homeless. The mayor said they have shelter beds available for the people who want them and makes it seem like a kind gesture and a choice when in reality they're being forced into going to shelters where none of them feel safe, and that's even if there's a bed available. They're being stripped of their ability to make choices in their life. They're being arrested and punished for the disadvantages and their distrust of the system is growing rather than decreasing. I truly believe we need to destigmatize and rehumanize our houseless community members, we need to seek first to understand and then use that understanding to make informed decisions. 
My request for the mayor, for law enforcement, for public officials, politicians, and anyone out there who is concerned with these issues is that you go out into the community and volunteer, engage in conversations with people who are experiencing homelessness. Ask them to tell you their story. Ask them what they believe that solution is. They are part of our community. They are humans just like you and me who have suffered and continue to suffer, who want a different life but are faced with extreme complex difficulties. These complexities require a deep understanding that honors their unique individual challenges with unique and individualized solutions. Bobby Lee, time's up. Thanks very much for coming down. Kevin, Dennis, and Sarah. I donate my time to Demi. Okay, great. Hi guys, my name is Demetra Enoch. Council President, sorry, point of order. Can yes. we give our time to another individual? I'm sorry, what? Can we, I don't believe we can give our time to another individual. We've done we? that before. Did, okay. did you want to have, do you have other council member support? That's fine. Uh, I, again, just know we have a lot of speakers today and I'm worried that that happens more than once. And so. Well, we've done it before. I think, I think I'm, we've, we've I'm done okay it before. I'm okay if we want to do so. it. It's just, we'll, sorry. we might do it more than once. Go ahead. Um, last year, I owned a coffee shop called Bohemian Brew. They were, there were long-term dogs at Scraps that weren't getting noticed. The community were unaware of how long these dogs have been there. Point of order. This is about our Scraps agenda item. Did you want to speak to the Scraps agenda item when it comes up? Yes, please. Okay, we'll put you on that list. Thank you. Great. Check if anybody else has. I, yeah. So um, just point of order. If anybody else wants to talk about Scraps, make sure your name is on the sheet that is where we speak to the legislation. So it's not an open forum discussion item. Do you want to read the next people's names? Just so, so um, Kevin, Dennis, Sarah, Hannah, Anthony, Catherine, Carson, Maximilian, if you want to speak on scraps, you'll need to wait until that legislative item comes up. Okay. So we have um, Dennis next. Is he online? Is he virtual or is he phoning in? Can you ask him to hit star three? Can you hit star three, Dennis? Go ahead, Hi, Dennis. this is Dennis. Before you start my two minutes, could you pull up that concerncompanions.com clown uh, website, Jacoby, please? Yes. Hi, Dennis Flynn. I live near St. Charles. You'll find links to everything I reference at concerncompanions.com slash clown. At the August 28th meeting, I voiced concerns about new health clinics and high schools, specifically denying parental involvement in their children's important decisions. Please page down two times, Jacoby. A council member disparaged my concerns as myths, claiming there is available space, parents must consent, and kids can't just walk in and that all minor consent laws are followed. I called North Central and they informed me there are no surplus classrooms or other administrative space unused. After four phone calls, the Shadle principal finally responded, telling me they are not using any unused classroom space, but rather some other nebulous location in the building. Page down two times, please, Jacoby. At concerncompanions.com slash clown, I scanned a Spokesman Review article quoting the Spokane School's project manager saying these will be, quote, a walk-in clinic for our students, end quote. Page down four times, please, Jacoby. A link to the CHAZ website says they withhold info from parents starting at the age of 12. Yes, 12. Including birth control, which includes abortion referrals, STDs, and behavioral health referrals, which includes gender-affirming care. Page down, please, again. Get this. The CHAZ website even says that withholding information from you about the services your child received does not mean your child receives services without your knowledge. No joke. Not malarkey. Even if these types are a low percentage of visits, how many kids need to be negatively impacted for you to consider this a legitimate parental concern? For me, that number is pretty much at zero. Please page down to the end of the page, Jacoby. Everyone can make up their own mind on who is spreading myths. It seems obvious to me it wasn't me. And being super supportive of targeting low-income kids to exclude from parental guidance, do the words systemic injustice come to mind? Again, that's concerncompanions.com slash clown. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Sarah, then Hannah, and Anthony. 
Sarah is online. Oh, okay. Does she need to press star three? I see her. Sarah, go ahead when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. I'm not sure if I can turn the video on, but I, I am here. Can you hear me? We can hear yes, you. we can. Um, hello, Madam Chairwoman, wonderful members of the council. My name is Sarah Love. I live in Cheney, uh, but I work less than a block the division in the street at Compassionate Addiction Treatment. Um, so I was also present for the press conference held in our parking lot two weeks ago, and it, it really deeply affected me, so I felt compelled to come and speak to you tonight. During the press conference, an officer referenced the area we work in as gateway to the city. He expressed concern about the impression we might be making on guests drive through the area. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that the ultimate measure of a person is not where they stand in moments of comfort, but where they stand at times of challenge and controversy. I think we're in the midst of a defining moment in Spokane, and I believe that we have an opportunity right now to decide who we are as a city and as human beings. You know, an opportunity to ask ourselves more deeply what kind of impression we actually want to make. You know, are we the kind of people and the kind of city that's gonna take this crisis and break it up into small pieces and scatter it around so we can drive down to Vision Street and pretend like the problem isn't happening? Or are we the kind of city that's gonna use compassion and empathy, honesty, integrity, love, kindness uh, as our guiding principles and values um, that can help us create impactful, sustain sustainable, and, and like meaningful change? Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Hannah, Anthony, Catherine? Is anybody online? Is Hannah an online person? Hannah, if you're online, I'm gonna unmute you. I think I see you here. Go ahead when you're ready. Can you hear me? Yes. I am here to speak on the scrap issue, so I believe I'll just wait until that comes up, correct? Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank Okay. Um, I'll circle this here to Kobe. Anthony, is Anthony here? No, we'll have to wait till that legislation comes up. Uh, Catherine, Korak, you here? Oh, there you go. Good evening. Council President and other council people. I am speaking um, on behalf of the kind of services that we could envision um, at the current track shelter. Although we are just opening the discussion of that matter and certain people have been recommended or not to continue to run that shelter or not. Um, I think we should keep in mind what we need. Um, I'm a licensed mental health counselor. Um, I have a lot of experience with substance abuse treatment along with mental health um, treatment. I have lived experience with mental illness um, and I have done volunteer work with both Jules Helping Hands and the Salvation Army. And what I see is um, <coughs> currently um, we don't have enough services out there for the folks that are currently there. And I think as we go forward and try to envision the kind of services um, and who should run the shelter, they need to include, they need to be rich in services. Okay, simply warehousing people um, is not adequate. Um, we need mental health services. We need a substance use disorder. Uh, services, and we need plenty of opportunity for assessment to see what people actually need, um, because many of their issues have nothing to do with either of those. They more have to do with housing or lack thereof and the income. So I would also encourage there be a, a contingent of peers and peer navigators to help persons access housing. and advocate for themselves. Those are the kinds of things that need to be included out there, whether they be out there or brought out there, one way or the other. That's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Carson, then Maximilian. 
Carson online. Carson Spratt. Yeah, Carson Spratt. Okay. Okay. All right, then uh, Maximilian. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maximilian Martinet. Uh, I come to speak to this council and my fellow citizens in Spokane and the greater Northwest region about fluoridation and an agenda to kind of keep this and pushing it further down past the election where you know, we both lose our voice and our right to clean water. Uh, this is something, we're, we're polluting 24 billion gallons of water so that we can possibly ingest just 1% of that fluoridation. And it touch our teeth, because we're not supposed to uh, ingest fluoride. It's a poison, it says right on your toothpaste. And for it to be happening at the same time that the tribes are trying to purify our water and make them sacred again, for salmon and that we're dealing with this problem in airway heights at the exact same time and we're talking about spending millions of dollars that we shouldn't be able to afford with all of these problems that we have before us. While we already have clean water, we're going to spend millions of dollars to take this mining waste from thousands of miles away and dump it straight into our aquifer, one of the best, the second largest in the world. It's, it's absolutely incredible water and we're going to poison that water. Because if, if there's even a glass of this here, if it touches you, if you breathe this chemical in, fluorosilicic acid, it kills you. And we're dumping 1.5 million pounds of this poison into our aquifer. That's what we will be doing if we vote for this. And so at least we should have a vote for it, or we should just say no to it and keep our water water. And I think that that's pretty much all I have to say about it. Thanks for coming down. All right, we're going to switch gears to our consent. Council President. Yes. Um, that was everybody who hadn't spoken this month at Open Forum, but we didn't meet our 15 okay. threshold. And who were we? So we have taken one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We can take four. All right. Let's start with Rick Bocook then. Well, we're good. We have a good audience. So <clears throat> all this petty stuff put aside, <clears throat> everybody listen. We do not have a community protection zone in Spokane. What this means, level two, level three child molesters, sex offenders, they can come to the parks, the playgrounds, the malls, and you can do nothing about it. <clears throat> and you should be paying attention to this stuff because it can, it can be done in the city. It's done in the cities across, in the coast. They have community protection zones over there. We need it back here. And I'll, I'm going to repeat this. There's a level three sex offender working at Selex Northtown Mall. His name is Dean McGinnis. And I don't ever get feedback about this guy. But he got caught at this mall over here, River Park Square. And now he's working at Northtown. And is anybody going to do anything about it? I got trespassed because I was raising the awareness about this. And I was told that I was threatening them all because I want to reveal about this creepy guy working at the mall. And it should stop. <clears throat> and, I, and, and so if anybody's going to pay attention to really heavy stuff, this stuff... We should be protecting our children. We should be taking, protecting our mates against people like this. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Robinson. Tom Robinson. I saw him out there. All right. Uh, Tim Kinley. I'm here. Okay, you're going to, you're first, then Tim Kinley. Tom Robinson, Spokane resident. Uh, last time I spoke, I spoke about religious groups that are dangerous, and I'm going to give you an example of what happened to me in Spokane 
from a dangerous religious group. Now, I'm going to read to you from the Spokesman Review newspaper. Tom Robinson, who runs an active Facebook group on local issues, held a sign reading, Ken Peters, loser. At one point, former Proud Boy William Hoolings, who is a frequent speaker at Spokane City Council meetings, crossed the street to confront Robinson. Spokane police, who were monitoring the scene, walked over and the conflict appeared to resolve quickly. Hooling said if he continued to engage with Robinson, police told him he could be charged with disorderly conduct. This is what happens with these groups that have former Proud Boys and Proud Boys around the group is pretty soon they're intimidating citizens who are exercising their First Amendment rights. That's the problem with these religious groups is for, for whatever reason, they, they attract uh, fringe actors who are unsavory, to say the least, and downright dangerous. This man told me, I can't say it in here, he said the word a couple of times in here, I'm going to F you up, is, is why the police got involved with this man. Now, that was the threat he made to me uh, uh, at, as I was exercising my First Amendment rights. Now, that's, that's what happens when uh, you, religious leaders don't police these people who are fringe hangers-on, who shouldn't, shouldn't even be encouraged in any way to be around them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim, and then Sunshine. Tim Kinley, I'm feeling pretty happy. I got a personal record going on here now, two weeks in a row. Uh, there was a point where I didn't think I'd be able to speak at all. I would like to know if you had a policy change as far as what kind of information you have to give in order to speak up here. Um, okay, wait. Because I'm sitting there and I just don't know if I'm just going to be next because I haven't given the, uh, my city. Uh, but I lived in other cities and they established a policy that you had to say something positive first before you spoke, I mean, before you got into the issue you wanted in open forum. Well, as you can guess, my first time I spoke after that policy was established, I didn't say something positive. And a city council member just kind of go, oh, they didn't say something positive, you know. Well, that's compelled speech. And of course, Guess when that policy ended? That day, because they understand it. So I, I just think it would be good to let people know what your policy is. And, and uh, one council member here made a comment about the validity of a person making a statement uh, if they don't give their name or they don't give their city. Well, it should never be on that. It should always be on the validity of the statement they make, and that alone. So. Uh, I would like to know that for sure. And a lot of accusations are being spread around uh, just before me and stuff. No way to verify it or anything like that. And, you know, from a guy that goes around flipping everybody off at TCAP, I'm just surprised that he'd be concerned that somebody swore at him. So um, no compelled speech, please. Thank you. Sunshine? Jeff was one of my go-to people. I, I'm kind of devastated I didn't know he passed. Um, he always returned all my, my letters and wrote me very compassionately. As a mentally ill person, he was someone that I could rely on. Um, I think it's really important to realize that um, the what we're doing down on State Street and Pacific and that area is affecting all the neighborhoods right now. Um, I live on East Riverton, I think is what it's called, and we have multiple new um, arrivals of homeless. We have, where they're not just on the hill now, now they have tents on the top of the hill. We have, um, 
They're very respectful people, uh, very family oriented, very kind. Um, it's funny, being someone who's been homeless a lot, I, I was kind of like hesitant like us and them. And then my buddy's like, hey, they'll help us with your couch. <laughs> And uh, that's when I got to know these people. But in the few weeks that you guys have been patrolling down there more often, the encampments are growing in our neighborhoods now. So you're pushing them into our neighborhoods where people, a lot of people don't want them to be seen. And um, they have kids and all that stuff. So I think it's really important to remember that. And that they, uh, my friend had to kind of humble me and be like, Sunshine, they're one of us. And sometimes now that I'm in housing, I forget that. Um, I think it's really, really important to build up that um, down on State Street and Pacific humanely. I think um, it's important to protect I'm glad for the police presence, for the protection part of it. Um, I think it's really devastating, though, that we don't have anything down there to refocus these people, and they're stuck only thinking about their survival. Sunshine. It, thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to switch gears to our consent agenda. So, uh, Ms. Sister, do you want to read it, please? Okay. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, multiple family housing property tax exemption conditional agreements with A, Pavel Semenikin and Liana Williams for the future construction of approximately four units at parcel number 35341.1125, commonly known as 3925 East 32nd Avenue. B, Ajit Singh and Hardish Singh Kinda for the future construction of approximately nine units at parcel numbers 35053.3608 and 3503.3609, commonly known as 3134 North Stewart Street. C, Ajit Singh and Hardish Singh Kinda for the future construction of approximately six units at parcel number 35053.3615, commonly known as 18 East Liberty Avenue. The conditional agreements will ultimately result in the issuance of final certificates of tax exemption to be filed with the Spokane County Auditor's Off Assessor's Office post-construction. Number two, grant award from the Office of Justice Programs Office for Victims of Crime to provide domestic violence intervention treatment through April 30, 2026. $500,000 relates to Special Budget Ordinance C36442. Item number three will be considered separately. Item number four, Washington State Department of Ecology Agreement number WCQ 2023 Spokane 00120 for a grant award with match requirement to perform a tape project for wastewater management. $67,011, number five, value blanket with ATS Inland Northwest LLC, Spokane Valley, Washington, for the standardized purchase of HVAC equipment, parts, sensors, control systems, and other HVAC system components, $500,000. Number six, contracts with ATS Inland Northwest LLC, Spokane Valley, Washington, for A, the standardized purchase of HVAC equipment and the installation, maintenance, and servicing of HVAC management software, control systems, equipment sensors, and either HVAC system components. $300,000 B, the standardized purchase of HVAC maintenance service, $300,000 annually. Number seven, public works contract with T.W. Clark Construction, LLC, Spokane Valley, Washington, for the wastewater building office expansion from November 1, 2023 through October 31, 2025, $865,080 plus tax if applicable. Number eight, purchase of used un undercover vehicle for the police department's tactical operations team, not to exceed $40,000, including tax and commissioning. Number nine, report of the mayor of pending eight claims of payments of previously approved obligations, including those of parks and library through September 15, 2023, total $9,465,047.99 with parks and library claims approved the respective boards. Warrants excluding parks and library total $8,882,886.46. B, payroll claims of previously approved obligations through September 16, 2023, $9,472,919.92. Number 10, city council meeting minutes for September 11, September 14, and September 21, 2023. Thank you. Uh, we don't have anyone signed up, so do we have any council commentary? Yes. Can we pull number three to yeah, vote separately? Do you want to, or, what do you want to do with I it? would actually make a motion to defer number three for one week. Okay. Marlene, did you want to speak to that? Mm 
Normally, Council Member Sapone, I would agree with you, but our concern here is that it took us a while to get um, Oregon ready to take our waste compared to Washington. And so we fear there might be a gap between the service that we have today and the service that we're buying on the new contract. And with that gap, we would have to basically divert all the waste because we don't have a way to store the ash in the interim. So we'd have to bypass the garbage and send it at a higher cost. Um, all to landfill during that time period. So we, there time, there's a little bit of a time of the essence here. Yeah, I, I actually asked Chris, because we actually had moved it back quite a bit because we were working out some um, concerns that we had between Oregon DEQ and Washington Ecology. I do have additional information if, if you want to ask. Yes. Um, Please, so, go ahead. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, go ahead. So, you know, we um, came a year ago about this time and it renewed the contract we had for one year. At the time, the cost had increased so much that this council asked us to go out for an RFP to consider our other options to make sure that we were getting the best cost option and the best option for the citizens. And we did that. And we got two responses from two experienced companies. We have no, both companies can do the service. That, that isn't the question that we put together a committee included Mr. Wright, included Chris Averett, Deb Geiger from the county who runs solid waste there, um, Jen uh, Larson, who is our environmental analyst in, in, uh, at the Waste and Energy Facility, and David Payne, our plant manager. And the six of them reviewed the RFP based on the criteria that were listed. And those in criteria included management, sustainability, references, experience, and cost. I would argue that most of the other um, criteria, they're pretty equal on them. They, they both are experienced. They both take ash from, they take, um, Republic takes ash from us. Waste Connections takes ash from a facility in Oregon. The, the biggest difference was cost. Um, and the cost difference is $1.1 million a year. And so for us, we felt like the low cost option was the way we needed to go. Because remember, all of that money comes from the citizens of Spokane. They are our rate payers. So um, with, with that in place, that's what we went through. We went through a, a procedure, a process that's appropriate, um, and followed that purchasing procedure all the way through. And, and just one more time, I want to just clarify, there is no negative impact to employees of the city of Spokane as a result of this change? No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't change um, the number or the, the duties of the employees at the plant. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, no, wait. Okay. Go you have, and then Council Member Wilkerson. Well, I was, I was just going back to the timeline. So what happens if we don't approve of this then? If, if you don't what? approve the contract, we would have to start over. And but we, I was like, that would be a worse consequence than delaying for a week, right? C correct, yes. Can we do like a one-week extension with the current contract? I, I don't know that because we're leaving that contractor. Ordinarily, if it were the same contractor, it would be easy to um, negotiate a one-week extension. But when you switch contractors, it's, it, you don't have a lot of leverage. Councilmember Wilkerson. I know that uh, it had been mentioned the standards for the disposal of the ash was different in the state of Washington and Oregon. Mm -hmm. So... My concern is by going to Oregon, is there a lower standard for the mitigation of that ash? No, we, we were treating, um, our ash is actually designated by the state of Washington as, as municipal solid waste, the same as it will be in Oregon. Um, we chose to take a higher, a different approach with the monocell um, just because it was available to us. But there is, it's regarded the same in, in both states. So we're getting appropriate cover, um, in the state of Oregon, they have to—they have all of their DEQ rules. So basically, ecology and DEQ look at it a little bit differently. They have a little different rules, but they're all treating it at a very high level. And again, this is in compliance with our own sustainability action plan. It, it is in compliance. We found the transportation to be about even. So um, Republic takes it by rail, mm -hmm. and um, Waste Connections would truck it. So, but the, there are differences there. The, the truck can handle more weight than the rail, so it takes fewer cars, fewer trips to go by truck. Also, you have to acknowledge that there is um, a truck that has to take it from waste to energy to the rail yard and from the rail yard when it arrives back to the landfill. When you add those things in, they're about even. Now, I haven't done the greenhouse gas study to tell you if it's, you, you know, if there's a little bit of difference, but um, from the evaluation that the committees did, it was, it was basically an even score on that sustainability point. Yeah, and we just brought up because it's a $4.5 million contract. It absolutely is, yes. And so it's a significant amount of money to make sure that we are honoring our own sustainability plan and not that ever doubt your due diligence 
but there was just questions that council never had information to, so thank you. No, and I, and I appreciate that, council member. I, I want you to look at $4.5 million uh, uh, contracts critically, so I do appreciate that. Any other questions for Marlene? Just to be clear, if we delay this for a week, it is not to our advantage. We think there's risk. Okay. Yes. All right. Did you, what, what did you want to do, Council Member Spoon? <coughs> okay, that's a good answer. All right. Um, let's approve. Hard, hard choices. I, yes, they're all hard choices. All right. Um, all those in favor of approving the I'm consent? sorry, there's a motion on the table. Uh, there was no. There was no second. I withdrew it, I guess. Well, I know, I didn't know if we had yeah, gotten I'll, there. We I'll withdraw it. Yeah. Okay. Where was I? Oh, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thank you. All right, now we're going to move on to hearings because we'd like to make sure our hardworking staff is able to go home before 11 o'clock tonight. So uh, hearing H1. Council President. Yes. Um, just to be sure, uh, I did not read Our number choice. three because I understood we were taking that separately. Do you want to go ahead and separately? do that, please? Sure. No, item number three, five-year contract with Waste Connections, Vancouver, Washington, for the transportation and disposal of incinerator ash from the waste energy facility beginning November 17, 2023, anticipated annual cost approximately $4,500,000. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, now we're good. Correct, Ms. Sister? Yes. All right, let's go on then to uh, hearings, H1. H1, Resolution 2023-79, authorizing a transfer of real property, 30, 3011 East Wellesley Avenue to the Northeast Public Development Authority and execution of purchase and sale agreement. Okay. Is anybody briefing this for us? Jesse Bank is here. Oh, yeah. Jesse. Je Jesse is here. He has briefed it previously. Okay. Yeah. Did anybody question... Questions for him? We good? All right. Done such a so, job. that's fine. We're good, Jesse. Sorry. We're good. All right. We have two people signed up to speak. Uh, hearing two. Sorry. We have no one signed up to speak. So, <laughs> any council commentary? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll be brief. I've sp spoken about this a few times. Uh, I'm just really excited. Northeast Spokane, I think, is on the rise, and I think this is a great. Uh, opportunity that we have to really see another amazing project that's going to actually do a lot of good for the neighborhood and for Northeast Spokane. So really appreciate all the time and work that Jesse has put into making this uh, proposal work and the uh, uh, Northeast Public Development Authority support for moving forward. I just want to say kind of the same thing. Jesse, you are the guy. Um, you worked really hard on this and sitting down with every council member um, with just the facts and explaining it to us so that we all understood what was happening. Um, it, it was just, it was delightful working with you. So thank you so much for your work. And I do believe this is going to be a big, big um, benefit to the, to the neighborhood. Did you want to say something? I'll just quickly say again, I think that there's a lot of momentum in Northeast Spokane, and I'm thankful for uh, Council Member Cathcart and Jesse and Amanda and everybody who's worked really hard on this. Terry, working very hard on this to, uh, uh, to see some, some really exciting projects moving forward in the Northeast. Uh, we just got some exciting news about some tree canopy that's going to be happening that will largely affect the Northeast. There's just a lot going on right now, and I'm excited to see what the future holds for us. So, Amen. Okay. All right, folks, prepare to vote. Good vote. Thank you. Uh, I Member Ulrich. Oh, oh, I missed. Sorry. Not a good vote. Do we have to do it? <laughs> All right. If you must. Oh, Prepare like, to vote. I have one. There it is. Okay. Thank you. I take it. All right. Timing is everything. <laughs> Next is hearing number two. H2, final reading ordinance C36441 relating to shoreline regulations to accommodate aquaculture, amending Spokane Municipal Code Section 17C.190.500, agriculture Section 17E.060.470, aquaculture, and Section 17E.060.690 shoreline primary use. Thanks. We do have two people signed up. Um, Hameni and Tom. If I mispronounced your name, I apologize. All right, Madam Chair, it's been happening my entire life. 
<laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair, uh, the rest of council. My name is Hemi James. I'm a, a vice chairman of the Coeur d'Alene Tribe, uh, and I'm here to talk today about uh, uh, the uh, proposal you have in front of you to accommodate aquaculture within the city limits of Spokane. As I'm sure you all are aware, within the last couple of years, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe has purchased a piece of property known as the Pilcher property with the intentions of keeping uh, perhaps the integrity of open spaces, but to promote uh, the ecosystem that sits right behind this building. As I'm sure everyone's aware, at one time in uh, history, uh, the land we stand on right now is one of the biggest salmon fisheries in the entire world. It was uh, something that sustained my people for uh, thousands upon thousands of years. I don't know if uh, you're all aware, but in the last week, the Coeur d'Alene tribe, the Spokane tribe, and the Colville Confederated tribes signed a monumental deal with different federal agen agencies to explore the viability of salmon reintroduction to this system, the Upper Columbia, which includes the Spokane arm. We want the opportunity to use some of this funding to explore the, this reintroduction by the possibility of putting a salmon rearing facility as well as a hatchery on this Pilcher property on Lower Hangman River. In order to do that, we need your, you fine individuals to put that into your code. My tribe has always come with open arms, open hand, and open hearts to work in conjunction with local authorities. And that's why you see me standing here today and speaking on behalf of my people. We envision that one day, it might not be me and it might not be you, but possibility of my grandkids standing on these falls and catching a salmon in order to take home to feed their families. Your voting uh, for this amendment would set those wheels in motion that one day we might possibly see it again. Thank you for the time, and uh, I appreciate the job that you guys do. Thank you. Appreciate it. And then Tom. Uh, thank you. My name is Tom Billadu. I'm an employee of the Coeur d'Alene Tribe in their fisheries program, and I just want to expand a little bit on what Councilmember James uh, talked about earlier how this program would specifically fit and to support reintroduction within the Spokane watershed. Namely, it's a way to get fish in the water so we can gather data on these fish. This type of program has support throughout the region, including here locally. Um, by the, I, I believe we've received formal letters of support, not just from the tribes, from the Upper Columbia United Tribes, from the Leita Valley Neighborhood Council and the Spokane Riverkeeper. Um, but it also fits within the resolutions that have been passed within the city already to promote the recovery of salmon within the watershed here. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you again. Take care. Thank you. Appreciate it. Council commentary. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I'm excited for this project. Um, looking back at the history of the United States, one of the three great sins, in my opinion, was the way that we treated uh, native populations and native tribes. And um, I'm hoping that this is a step forward for us in this area, that we can continue to expand upon that. As you said, you know, maybe the wheels just start turning and I'm sure there'll be plenty that come after us that continue this work going forward. And so uh, God bless you guys. And I hope it, I hope it goes really well. Anyone else? Go ahead. I have to say something. I'm so proud um, to support this. Um, and I will support this in memory of my grandmother, who was a Spokane tribal member, my mother, who was a Spokane tribal member, and several aunts and uncles. Um, and I remember my grandmother fondly, and I remember her never feeling really comfortable or welcome coming to Spokane. And every time we do something like this, to me, it's a step forward. And I am just so proud that this is before us. And I'm proud that it's happening now that I can vote on this before I'm out of office. So thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, prepare to vote. Prepare to vote. Here we go. go. Oh, I may have blown it. OK. OK. Good job. Thank you. All right, Terry. Next one is the um, special, special budget ordinance. Okay. Ordinance C36442, amending ordinance number C36345, 
passed by the City Council December 12, 2022, and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2023, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2023, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declared an emergency and appropriating funds in. Miscellaneous grants fund number one increased revenue by $500,000. A of the increased revenue $500,000 is provided by congressional designation for domestic violence intervention treatment. Two increase appropriation by $500,000. A of the increased appropriation $500,000 is provided solely for professional services. This action arises from the need to accept the congressionally designated award for DVIT. Thanks. We don't have any council or we don't have any um, signups, but we would like some council commentary if you care to share. Go ahead. Well, I'm certainly glad to be able to support this. We know domestic violence is on the rise in our community. Any additional funding that we can get to help fight this and support women and families and men, because it's not just only women, but men receive violence as well, to put these supports in place that we have the funds and we got them through the federal legislation and it wasn't taken out of city resources, but the services are made available. So I'm glad to support this and to accept these funds for the purpose they were intended. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, prepare to vote. Good job, thank you. And next, Terry. Ordin emergency ordinance C36443 amending the specific type of police vehicles allowed to be procured and commissioned as cited in ordinance C36249 that was passed by the council on August 1, 2022 and declared an emergency. Okay, and we've been briefed on this several times. So we know that um, what we originally did was put information in a SBO that shouldn't have been there. This is straightening that out. We have one person signed up, Will Hewlings. He's right there. Uh, sorry, I, what are we uh, speaking of? Police vehicles. Oh, yes. So the police vehicles. Um, one thing, a uh, concern I have with that, I'm all for, obviously, uh, vehicles, and I'm sorry, um, my name is Will Hewlings, and I live downtown. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, it was a, probably about two years ago, I ran into an SPD officer, and he was driving a Dodge Challenger. Now, the SPD, according to him, he said that they use it for recruitment, and that it was a drug, like a car that they seized in a drug bust. So when I seen this, you know, you guys want the $40,000 or whatever it is, approval, which is cool, but I'm just like, why don't they, maybe this is something the public safety chairman could think about. Um, why not using these drug seizure cars? Why now go and buy another vehicle? Why not just use what we already have? So that's, my only suggestion, but thank you. Thank you. Council commentary, go ahead. Yeah, quickly, this is for us. We've been trying to purchase police vehicles for some time now, and um, because of uh, short production lines and uh, a, a looming um, auto worker strike, uh, we needed to, to pivot a little bit to give some flexibility to our fleet department and the police department to be able to purchase the vehicles they need. And while we do purchase used vehicles, we've heard recently how we've been purchasing used vehicles. When you're talking about, you know, a hundred vehicles, you know, we're not out there trying to seize a bunch of property to use for our police department. And so what we do want to do is we do want to give them the equipment that they need and the vehicles that they need. And I think this is a, a, a good way for us to do it. And I'm, I'm glad that we're going to be supporting us tonight. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just add that our uh, police fleet has been severely uh, depleted over time. And as we have just not been able to keep up um, over the last few years, in part uh, most recently because of, of some of the supply chain issues, it's gotten to be a pretty severe situation where we've had to borrow cars from other jurisdictions for various events and things like that. So it's a pretty big deal and giving as much flexibility to our uh, police uh, for force as possible for purchasing new fleet 
is, I think, really important and something we have to do. Uh, the fact is, one of the greatest recruitment tools that we could enact would be a take-home car program, and it's something that, that is really successful in other jurisdictions, but we're not even close to the point that we could even begin to put that sort of program together because of how substantially behind we are. So catching up is a really, really important thing that we've got to do. Anyone else? I would add that anything that we seize as evidence it, or is evidence, so we can't then turn around and have police use it. Sometimes it sits in the evidence room for a while until the trial is completed, and you know when you get into the courtroom, you never know how long it's going to take for somebody to actually come to trial and be convicted. So uh, we don't necessarily aren't able to use cars that are seized. And they're not all brand new Dodge Challengers. And they're not yeah. brand new Dodge Challengers. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. All right. Anything else? All right. Prepare to vote. Very good, thank you. I want to skip ahead, Terry, because I see Eldon sitting over there looking for Lorne, and I want to get him on his way. So we, can we go to C35425, please? Ordinance C35425 is amended, vacating a portion of Ross Court from the east line of Realign North Crescent to the west line of Granite Street. Okay, and Eldon, is that you that's going to be briefing it? All right. Actually, yeah, we're going to make you come up just to, just because. No, we don't have anyone signed up. Do we have questions for Eldon? Here he is. Okay. Yeah, basically, <clears throat> what we were doing is actually just uh, realigning that intersection of Granite Street and Ross Court so we could have a public turnaround. Originally, we had vacated that full intersection, and so we didn't want people turning around on private property for review retirement center. So that's the purpose of the revised ordinance. Okay. Thank you. No questions? Thank you, Eldon. You can go home now. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Prepare to vote. Good. Thanks. All right. Now, Terry, um, let's go back to where we were and uh, resolution 445. Uh, sorry, ordinance 445. Ordinance C-36-445 relating to animal control regulations amending section 10.74.030 establishing new sections 10.74.090, and .110 and repealing chapter 10.24A of the Spokane Municipal Code and declaring an emergency. Okay, thank you. As you can imagine, we have quite a few people signed up and in order, we have Fred, Dave, and Anna. So um, I know Dave is on um, phone. Fred, are you here? Come on down. Good evening. My name is Freddie B, and I'm here to speak out and correct some mistruths stated by Scraps representatives to the media and others as to why they recently killed a number of dogs at Scraps. I speak here not from an emotional biased place, but primarily as an expert in the field of canine behavior assessment, modification, and rehabilitation, who has assessed and worked with seven of the dogs killed by scraps they claimed were aggressive and unadoptable. Before I go any further, I need to validate myself as a canine behavior specialist to support what I'm about to testify to, as many who claim this have neither the experience, education, nor expertise to support their claim. I do on all accounts. Beginning in 2016 and up until today, and starting with the Northern California Campfire Disaster, I have donated thousands upon thousands of hours to four different animal shelters, to half a dozen animal rescue organizations, and to the communities I have lived within and working with and rehabilitating some of the most fearful dogs, dogs with behavior issues, and dogs specifically with aggression issues. Of note, most aggression in dogs is fear-based. In 2019, after a year of studies and exams, I became a certified dog trainer and began my dog training business with my specialty being working with dogs having fear-based behaviors. Over the past seven years, I have diligently and tirelessly worked towards earning the reputation and privilege of calling myself an expert in canine assessment, modification, and rehabilitation via ongoing education, research, hands-on experience, and practical application in both the shelter and the rescue environments I donate my time to and in the private sector. I'm currently a member in good standing with the Association of Professional Dog Trainers, Pet Professionals Guild, 
Animal Behavior College Alumni Association, International Association of Canine Professionals, and a supporting member of the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, as well as a certified evaluator with AKC's Canine Good Citizen Program. Now that I qualify myself as an expert, I would talk, like to talk about the seven beautiful canine souls, Max, Rudy, Rizzo, Rambo, Nezzy, Dougie, and Violet, Violet, who were among the ones killed by scraps, killed that scraps claimed were unadoptable, aggressive, and or could not be rehabilitated. I began assessing and working with them over four months ago, and I am here to testify as an expert that these dogs were absolutely adoptable and have been grossly misdiagnosed, which cost them their lives. I will be emailing all of you video evidence of my claims later. Often when a layperson sees a dog exhibiting fearful and or fear-based aggressive behaviors, they lack the knowledge, insight, and or understanding in canine behaviors to foresee and understand their potential in being successfully rehabilitated to the point they could be adopted or rescued. I believe as a well-educated and highly experienced expert that Scraps failed these sweet seven souls. Rudy, Max, Rizzo, Rambo, Nezzy, Dougie, and Violet. Thank you so much. Thanks, Fred. Um, Dave and then Anna, and then we're going to go back to Riker. Is Riker still here? Yep. Oh, you're way in the back. Okay. Get prepared. Uh, Dave M., do you want to hit star three? Good evening, Council. Go ahead, Dave. Thank you. The recent reports regarding scraps are appalling. This taxpayer-funded business, in my opinion, has violated their contract with the city and, more importantly, the citizens of Spokane. Scraps should, as soon as, po as possible, no longer be supported by our city with our city funds. Scraps has shown they aren't concerned with the lives they are contracted to protect. They are so brazen that they refuse to come before the council or us the public or even provide the requested documents and reports. Let's not beat around the bush. Let's call them who they really are, planned puppyhood. The taking of any life, especially one that has no voice and no choice, is flat out murder. The city council must take all appropriate action to stop the inhumane practices by scraps. A full investigation should be ordered into every murdered animal, along with investigating those at scraps responsible for ordering these killings. We cannot allow this atrocious behavior by scraps to continue. We must protect the innocent lives of all future victims of scraps planned puppyhood. This must end here and now. I thank you council for bringing this forward and encourage you to take strong action. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anna? Are you here? Come on up. Hi. President Kinnear, uh, the rest of the council, thanks for allowing me to speak. I am a little nervous. But uh, my name is Anna Von Vakias. And I am here to vehemently ask you to vote on this emergency ordinance for scraps. Um, the deaths of these dogs is unconscionable. It is not within the contract, as been mentioned. Um, and I think that was pretty clear to me from the beginning when I first talked to uh, the director, Mr. Ferrari. I called and asked him to, uh, with a piece of information for a dog that had been uh, failed three adoption attempts. Her name was Nancy. And uh, after he went on, well, anyway. So, I gave him some information since I network for dogs in high kill shelters in S Southern California, try and get them out um, with the help of other networkers and rescues. His parting words to me were, I alone, as the director, I'm going, will make any 
decisions on which dog, any dogs, to be euthanized. Now, I didn't really think much of that, <laughs> but uh, I thought, and since then, it's become clear it's a very opaque organization. It should be transparent. And I, the dogs were killed without the staff even knowing. So in addition to what you have in the ordinance, I would suggest that something like what California now has is that the public has to be notified of three days ahead of any dogs euthanasia so that there's a chance to pull that dog. And there's also another thing called shelter fatigue, which can directly and importantly affect a dog's behavior. And if you've ever seen the before and after pictures of rescues, you see the dogs have emotions, not feelings perhaps like humans, but they do have emotions because you can see. Anna, time's up. That they have. Thank you. All right. Uh, Riker, you want to come down? Right there. Hi, my name is Riker Morgan and I am 11 years old. I used to volunteer at Scraps with my mom until she was fired for speaking out about the killing of Amelia. But today I want to talk about the 14 dogs who were killed unjustly. I knew some of these dogs. I used to give them treats and talk to them. They would always sit for me and knew, and knew to gently take the treat from my hand. How does that make them dangerous? How does that make these dogs dangerous? I always ask my mom, how are the dogs at scrap, uh, Scraps doing that we've been talking about? And today I found out that 14 of them were killed for no reason. This made me really sad because I didn't even get to say goodbye. I didn't want them to die. I prayed they wouldn't die. I wish I could have saved them. <sighs> One of my goals I've written down and look at every day is to save all the dogs at, possible at Scraps. My mom even sent my last letter to the commissioners and no one even cared to respond but with a thank you. And to, to, the, many, to the many I knew, Cooper, Nezzy, Mai, Max, Bentley, Rudy, and Violet, and to those I get, didn't get to spend time with, Dougie, Balfour, Rambo, Ram, Rambo Hendrix, Rizzo, Bambi, and Bowser, I know we would have been friends. I'm sorry I couldn't save you. And, say goodbye. I'm sorry. I'm sorry my mom and so many others were fired. I'm sorry for those who had homes and rescues lined up and weren't let go. And mostly I'm sorry for your, that your killings got to be decided by those who didn't know, spend time with you, or love you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I know that's a hard act to follow. Um, that was a tearjerker. We're not going to clap, but I couldn't bear to make you stop because I wanted to clap too. Um, so, uh, Lisa, Deborah, and Tim, are you here? Anybody online? Lisa, if you're online, can you hit star three? Pardon? Are you Lisa? I'm Deborah Hunt. Okay, we're looking for Lisa. Lisa, are you online? Oh, oh come down, please. And after Lisa, then Deborah, and then Tim. I've not done this before, so. Anyways, um, oh, thank you. Oh. Um, so my name's Lisa White Tanner. Um, 
I live here in Spokane, um, County. I w um, was able to um, share, I want to share the virtual of the 14 dogs yesterday at Scraps. Um, I'm going to talk fast. Okay, so um, change is necessary to provide the care and training for um, the compassionate care and training with behavioral training as needed uh, with proper um, degree and knowledge <coughs> to do so. Um, I was fortunate in um, February of 2020 to adopt my dog, um, Dexter, from Scraps. He was doing the behavioral team, and some of the members are here. They did awesome care, and they generally cared about the dogs, even dogs who are in the other in the D dorms. So I know it can be done. It has been done, and I've had my dog since 2020. And he's a great, he's a pit bull. He's a great pit bull, and he's a great dog. So I know it can be done, um, and I believe the missions um, that they currently have about emphasizing and protecting those companion of animals who are lost, homeless, abandoned, abused, and under neglect. Okay, so that's, they're not even doing that. They're, as far as I feel, they're not. They're not doing any ethical um, practices for the dogs. Um, to me, how dogs are like children. You know, they trust us. We're the humans. We're the ones that help take care of them. So, yes, I wish um, we have proper new management or whatever you need to do with scraps. Um, so this doesn't happen. I know it's been 14 dogs. There's been more. So there's Amelia and some other dogs prior to the 14 that we um, honored yesterday. Um, I say my prayers to them every night, and I would do so. So whatever needs to be done, and I feel like I'm not making a whole lot of sense by trying to. So just please... You know, I'm sure we all have animals or children or something. They deserve um, to have a loving home, every one of them. And I, for kudos for all the, the baby girl team people who are here now who have worked, worked and been let go or fired or whatever, because they, they generally know the meaning of compassion for the animals. And thank you. Thank Bye. you. Now, Deborah, Tim, and Brenda. Again, I'm Deborah Hunt, and I built a business called Auntie Deb's Pet Salon in Spokane in 93. And I've been, I'm all approaching 70, I've been in pet rescue all my life, an old farm girl. And I have had problems with scraps when I was uh, pulling rescues and running fundraisers from the, from the lobby of scraps for homeless people that were caught up in the no sit, no lie law. And their dogs were automatically taken to scraps. And scraps made it very difficult for the homeless people to be able to get their dogs back. And scraps absconded with $100 off of my credit card when I went in the fundraiser from there and the gal positioned her head up and says, oh, I thought I heard the word donation. And so I said, no, nope, I didn't make that statement. I'd like my $100 back. Haven't gotten it back yet. And the phone calls I made to them were dismissed. A year ago, I took a rescue kitten in that had a broken leg, and I was assured that I would be kept up to date. I made several calls. I got different messages. Um, the cat was adopted out, which was the ultimate goal, right? And so I could live with that. But the communication there is, it, it needs help. So thank you. Thank you, thank you for stepping up and looking further into this because we've gone to the county commissioners and they sit there and they don't make eye contact with us when we're talking and they're not making any efforts. I personally had made phone calls, but now we have a watchdog group coming together. And I'm telling you what these people are, un are finding, <coughs> you're going to be enlightened. And I hope that you really take into consideration 
these little brown-eyed babies being killed. Do you know that Nezzy had adopters? Nezzy was kind of popular. Um, without divulging what will be presented to you at some point in time, uh, Director Ferrari's neighbors aren't fond of him and the statements he's made. I won't elaborate because that's considered hearsay, but again, I guess I'm just going to say thank you. Thank you, thank you for looking into this. It's much needed. Thank you. I'll thank you for coming down. And uh, next up is Tim, then Brenda, then Sharon. <coughs> Good evening. Thank you for recognizing, recognizing the urgency of this matter with scraps. I am Tim Malek. I have had the pleasure of getting to know a couple of you somewhat. And I had for two years worked with scraps, left on good terms. Thankfully, that was under the former director. And I worked very closely with the dogs that were struggling the hardest within the shelter. and. I did return after a little time of healing and as a volunteer and I am currently still active. I can, once again, I can cut things a little short for you to do to some of the other strong speakers that you heard, but I would go straight into ordinance basically when I read over the language in the current ordinance, uh, there are a few areas that really seem to be lacking in my eyes. I would ask that you please remove any of the language surrounding killing for space within the shelter that just really, there's, that's far too easy in the wrong hands. And then the next thing I get into where it starts to get a little more, more complex is when we're talking about euthanizing for behavioral reasons. And currently the director or a vet are allowed to make this decision. And that leaves, leaves this a uh, little too much in a single person's discretion. And the getting into the vet and their relationship with an animal in a shelter, that is typically not a very good one. And the current one is taking away from her primary duties of caring for the physical well-being of the animals. and deciding that she should, what she, she did a little bit of training that's to be encouraged, of course, but she seems to want to weigh in more on this decision and I guess use your own pet or yourself as an example. How do you feel when you go to the doctor? You, things are uncertain. You may have received painful treatments at best, uh, stranger has invaded your space. Do you think that this person should be allowed to pass judgment on your behavior? Are you at your best at that time? Are your pets, if you keep them in a good place when they visited the vet, that is just set up for failure, really? And the, the next extremely important part that I see is please do everything that you can to push for an independent advisory board. By, and key element would be of your choosing, not the organizations. That seems, seems quite obvious, but anything that can be done there would be very important. This, again, this decision cannot be allowed to be made. And Tim, yes. time's up, thank you. All right, thank you again. Uh, Brenda, Sharon, and then Tanya. Good evening, Council. My name is Brenda Wright. Um, I'm the Vice President of HART, we Humane Evacuation Animal Rescue Team, and I'm also part of the organization here called Dogs Playing for Life. Um, we operate out of Spokane, while getting dogs out to play in groups um, to make their shelters stay better and hopefully shorter. I've been involved in the welfare community for a long time, years ago trained to um, do aggression assessments, behavior testing, and most organizations at this point have let that go by the wayside. We've been proven over and over to ourselves that um, it's an ineffective way and it's inaccurate to test shelter dogs that way. It just doesn't work. We're using other methods now. 
um, recently, some months back, uh, we had a meeting at Scraps. Uh, the animal welfare community came together. Some of the shelters, um, uh, animal welfare agencies, uh, some of our rescues, and asked Scraps, how can we help you? How can we support you and get you back to doing what it is that uh, you're supposed to do for animal control before they're in quite so much hot water? And we agreed to uh, continue to do quarterly meetings. Um, we came up with some ideas. I can tell Scraps that um, you, they can't be a sanctuary. It's hard enough to be animal control and uh, in a, a shelter without being a sanctuary. They're not set up for that. Um, they're not prepared for that. But they don't have to kill those animals. They have to do what we've done forever in this community, and that's network and work with other organizations that um, do breed rescues and that are sanctuaries that have the ability to help those dogs until they can actually be homed into loving homes. And you've talk, heard uh, some of the people already speaking to the fact that we do believe that these dogs were um, available to be good pets at some point. Um, but instead, for some reason, this meeting seemed to be kicked to the curb. Um, they chose to go outside of our area to another state that kills a lot of dogs, by the way, um, and, and get some very bad advice that led to um, the tragedy of last week's killings at Scraps. Um, Scraps used to be um, the place where you knew to look for your dog if you lost your dog. It used to be the place where you could take a stray dog. It was there. That was the one place you went. Everybody knew that, and it worked very well. But unfortunately now, people are afraid to take dogs there. Um, they're not really doing animal control or, or taking in strays. And um, they've become very effective, ineffective in our community. And I think uh, we need some massive changes that are going to help put us back to having animal control. We need animal control in our community. But we need one that we can trust, one that's doing the best for the animals like they're supposed to. We used to have it. It used to be that way, so we know it can exist. I think we need some animal welfare experience. I think we need some direction and a plan, and I think we need some oversight. And um, I'm grateful that you are looking into this and are going to be spearheading this Thank you. in an effort to save um, our, our animals now and in the future that don't deserve to die. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Sharon, then Tonya, then Nancy. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Sharon Hayes. I reside in Spokane. I would like to speak today in regards to the Scraps Emergency Ordinance. Today it is needed and it's timely because Scraps killed 14 dogs last week without transparency or oversight. This ordinance, ordinance is a step in the right direction. Please vote yes. I would also like to speak on the interlocal contracts within the county. The, the verbiage should, be, should include no euthanasia will be performed due to overcapacity. Any euthanasia due to physical, mental, or emotional suffering should be agreed upon by an advisory board, which is not dictated by scraps, and should include but not be limited to a vet, an animal behaviorist, professionals in the field, and at least one volunteer. Scraps relies very heavily on volunteers. There is absolutely no way they could operate without these volunteers. These volunteers deserve the respect of being represented on an advisory board, which oversees euthanasia, on animals that they have worked with daily and closely. These volunteers are the ones that actually know these animals and know what to expect from these animals. Um, so I think the advisory board going forward is very important. But for now, vote yes on the emergency ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Antonia and Nancy and Antoine. 
and thanks for calling me up tonight. Um, I just want to say that um, I, th I think uh, we should keep the um, animals, you know, out of scraps, you know, and, and, keep, and keep them at home. You know, they, they, need, uh, they need safe homes, to, you know, to protect them too. You know, and and we need to tell our tell the children, you know, that their the the pets that they have, you know, are can be their their kids, you know, that they're taking care of, you know, and, and they need to pretend that they're, they're um, they have a family with them, too, you know, and they and they need to stop killing the animals in the scraps too you know and and kids too they might want to bring their pets to school with them too and they might want them to be their service animals too when they get older you know and and they they shouldn't parents shouldn't say no to not to, to get not giving them any pets, too, when they they get when they're little, too, because I think kids need pets too when they when they're growing up, too, to show, show them how to have a family, too, when they get older. Thank you, Thank you Tanya. Yeah. All right, Nancy, Antoine, and then Monica. Good evening. My name is Nancy Drinker. I'm a resident in Spokane. I've been in Spokane, Spokane County my whole life. Um, and over the past year, I've been a volunteer for all three animal shelters in our area, Scraps, the Humane Society, and Spokanimal. I'm currently active at Spokanimal. In the past year, volunteering at all of these organizations has been an eye-opener for me. With the recent atrocity, atrocity committed by Scraps, and the current and ongoing animal welfare crisis we are presented with in the city and county, I want to take a moment to bring to you an idea that has been talked about amongst my fellow volunteers as well as other shelter employees. In the interest of providing quality care for our area's animal companions, keeping our community safe and truly sticking with a no-kill policy, we envision all three shelter locations working in synergy as one large organization rather than separately. All those involved working together for the reason that we're all here, the well-being of the community's animals. We could designate uh, different locations for different animals. For example, one location for animal control and community members to bring strays, one location for ad adoptable animals to be, one place for those animals with medical and or behavioral needs to be making things more efficient and making more sense. Um, one of my fellow volunteers even thought of a clever name, Eastern Washington Animal Welfare Association, the Iwawa. <laughs> uh, Iwawa would have one regional director that would work closely with the city and county officials, and they would also oversee the op whole operation with a director at each shelter facility. This increases accountability as well as streamlines the flow of operations. So as we navigate this animal welfare crisis that we're in, let's practice forward thinking and long-term goals and long-term results. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Antoine, and then Monica and Donald. Oh, my name is Antoine. I think sometimes that we need to be honest with ourselves, and a lot of times it's us that uh, destroy our pets the way we treat them, and we don't. Or, or when they get old, we want to take them to the pound and leave them there, just like uh, the objects. And these are the things that we need to be thinking about if you're going to have a pet. And pets are animals. I love animals. I have pets, you know. And uh, and I heard somebody mention a sanctuary. Why not put some of that money for the pets that? that scrap can't, uh, that nobody wants, have a place for them where they can be, where they can roam. I mean, what's wrong with that? 
rather than getting mad and pissed and, you know, like children, you know, fire him or do this, you know, just, hey, let's be adults, you know. Put the funds, a sanctuary, because I have a, I have a, a pit bull. And I'll tell you one thing, I've always had one, I, you know, all my life. And I've never had any problems with a, a male. This time I bought a, I got a female. And it played with my cats. Okay? But I'll tell you one thing. When she got big, she killed one of them. I never taught her that. So I put her in a cage and said, okay, I'm going to take her to Humane Society. The cage was kind of like one of those fliffy flop. You know, he tore it up and killed two of my cats. I mean, I never taught that dog, but it's just, I figured it's a, it's a one-person dog, but I took it over there and I told the people at Humane Society, I said, I, this is a one-person dog. <laughs> Not, if you have kids, you know, it, it's a good dog. But for some reason, it just does not like cats. But anyway, I just want to say that, you know, put some money out there for a sanctuary. Okay? I mean, scraps can't do everything. Uh, it's not going to, how would I, same thing with the homeless. We're in the same situation with the homeless. People are homeless. Where do we put the money? We put the money in developers until their bills are paid off and there goes the rent. And where's the homeless? They're still out on the streets. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Monica, Donald, and Anna Silva. Thank you, Council. I want to thank um, Mike Cathcart and Ms. Stratton for your recent your interview and your articles regarding sc scraps and the heinous crime I believe they committed last Wednesday. Um, whether we, you break away from them, and because you know we do no longer trust them, or we get an independent agency, as someone else has uh, suggested, they need two things, um, transparency and accountability. Had these two things been in place in the first place, I don't believe the director of scraps could have been ongoing what he's been doing the last several years. So those two things need to be um, put into account moving forward. And um, it's our hope that um, the director, the current director, and his team are removed. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Donald, Anna, and Ted. Hello, I'm Don Hinton. Uh, I live here in Spokane. Um, on the 19th of May of this year, um, I had the great fortune to go to Scraps and adopt a dog. Uh, his name is Oatley. Um, he's a huge 96-pound um, Great Pyrenees mix. Um, he, but the day before, he had been taken off the adoption list and was, from what I heard, scheduled for a final behavioral assessment or analysis, whichever you call it. Um, but he was... I was afraid I was not going to be able to adopt him. I saw the picture of him. He reminded me of the dog I'd had previously. Um, but but uh, Mr. Ferrari, they, they let me take him that day. Um, and gave me some warnings about him, uh, that he was <coughs> aggressive, uh, fence fighter, uh, couldn't be trusted with uh, animals and whatnot, stuff like that. Um, but when I met him, I, I just knew that he was a shelter stress. He'd been there for two and a half years. He was their longest resident. Uh, he'd been there for half his life, locked into a small kennel, and so a uh, small cage. So, um, you know, you know that's got to have some negative effects on, on anyone's behavior. So, boy, since I got him in the car, my, my daughter went with me to, to look at him. Um, he was just like a free spirit, and um, I've not had any problems with him at all. Um, all the behaviors he had exhibited was... In my opinion, I'm, I've got an engineer. I'm not a behavioral specialist or an uh, analyst. Um, all his behaviors were just from shelter stress. And I'd, I'd ask any of you, would, you'd be stressed if you were locked up like that too or anybody in jail, whatever. Um, and you'd exhibit 
certain behaviors. Um, but the fact that they were going to, they removed him from the adoption list. And from what I understand, was going to put him on the list to be put down. And he would have been one of the 14 that was put down last week if I had not adopted him. And just, just to think how utterly amazing and special Oatley is. He is so intelligent and gentle and quiet, um, attentive. You can just tell him very quietly, just once, to speak to him like a, a person, say, this is no Oatley, and he won't do it again. And he's, he's so perfect. But, uh, so he's not aggressive. He's not a, a violent dog, and there would have been no reason to have put him down at all, none. Um, he just needed the right person to, to come along, and I'm very lucky to have him. Um, I, I, I do think Mr. Ferrari for letting me adopt him, but um, I, I have doubts about the current practices. Um, and I would like to thank the, the shelter volunteers, th those that have been fired because of recent management, and those that are still there for, for doing a very difficult job. Uh, they were all very nice to me when I was there, and, and I do appreciate that. So with all the negative um, opinion out there of scraps right now, I just hope that these people that spend so much of their, of their lives volunteering for uh, and working there at Scraps to help these animals, that, uh, that we do appreciate them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Anna, Ted Harris, and then Brianna. Anna, if you're online, can you hit star three? Nope. All right, um, let's go on to Ted. Harris, Means, and Brianna, then Demi. Um, it's not very common that I come to city council twice in the same year, but here I am speaking on the same issue. Uh, I came here a few months ago speaking about the problems at Scraps after my neighbors and I had to take care of a couple of loose dogs and receiving next to no support from scraps. They cited the, their unwillingness to take the, the animals on, the, on account of being full. Now let's make no mistake, choosing to adopt a no-kill policy and creating a full shelter is not more humane by putting dogs out on the street which will then die from either malnutrition, heat, ex, uh, heat exposure, cold exposure, or worse yet, being hit by cars. Let's be adults and let's acknowledge that. That said, it seems very clear that there is a, a deficit in leadership at the facility that would let this problem balloon out to, into its current proportion. I don't know any uh, I don't know what the justification for the 14 euthanized animals uh, was. However, I did read the reports that Spokane County had posted on its website. They posted 16 reports. One of them was incomplete with no recommendations. Of the others, one had been adopted and returned. Seven had documentation of bites, one of which bit a volunteer puncturing the skin into the fat and tissue. One required a fence of six feet or higher. Uh, Twelve required fences of ten feet or higher, which by the way is illegal in the city of Spokane. Three would require muzzles. All of the fence dogs would have required airlocks. That's where you put two gates in to prevent escape. And nine would have required that they never leave the property of the owner. Now, I don't know who prepared those reports. My understanding was it was the agents, it was the third party that was hired to do them. But who, which experts are we supposed to believe here? The experts locally or the experts from somewhere else or just take the director's word for it, I don't know. There's not enough information being garnered about this and you guys have had months to figure it out. So while I applaud the effort to create a no-kill environment and my preference would be a no-kill environment, I also must encourage you all to be realistic about how we, can, how we maintain an animal control agency. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Brianna, Demi, and Hannah.
Good evening, everyone. Sorry it's so late. I know it's probably been an exhausting couple of days. Uh, thank you so much for giving everyone your time tonight. So my name is Brianna Franzen. I live in Spokane Valley, and I'm speaking for the Underground Rainbow and the animal advocates in this room and outside of this room in our, in our county. Scrap slaughtered 14 dogs last week, one of which named Bambi. Bambi had an adopter who's a previous Scraps employee, certified in canine assessment of risk for shelters. You heard that right, CARS. A shelter behavior affiliate with the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants and who is pursuing her certified shelter behavior specialist credentials. Before leading into her support of amending and expanding the Spokane Municipal Code provisions, I'd like to make it clear that she is pro-euthanasia in cases of an irremediable medical suffering and when an animal poses high risk to the community. The 14 dogs were killed, their lives lost, the morning of September 20th and the 21st by the hands of Animal Protection Services. Bambi was one of them, and Bambi was a City of Spokane dog. The current verbiage state scraps is to restrict euthanasia to only those cases which the animal in the care of the facility is found to be in the process of dying or determined by a licensed veterinarian or animal behavior specialist to suffer from irremedial prognosis. Bambi was not suffering from irremedial prognosis as supported by her recommendations that Spokane County listed in her assessment. She was not deemed dangerous or potentially danger dangerous by law. Her behaviors during assessments showed consistent conflict reduction and attempts to avoid confrontation, and she was killed. Their lives were meaningless to Scraps. She had an appointment to adopt her back in May, and their family had been waiting to bring her home since May. She had a home and a dog bed waiting for her. Instead, they killed her. She is just one example of Scraps failing to honor and uphold their contractual obligations and the wishes of the community. I'll ask the audience, if you support amending and expanding the Spokane Municipal Code provisions to provide clear rules for animal control in the city of Spokane, including rules for euthanasia and true no kill, I ask that you stand now. Clearly, it's not just six people, as Scraps Management is trying to tell everyone. Almost the entire room is standing. We ask you to do the right thing. Vote yes on this emergency ordinance tonight, and we'll continue to help write the new ordinances to tighten up those rules. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Demi, Hannah, and then last but not least, Shamra. Hello, my name is Demi Enox. Um, last year I owned a coffee shop called Bohemian Brew. There were long-term dogs at Scraps that weren't getting noticed. The community were unaware of how long these dogs had been there. So I came up with the idea to promote these dogs on the coffee I sold by putting a sticker of the dog with a QR code for more information on the cups. I worked with Kevin Van Hook, which was a behavioral specialist at Scraps, and he would bring a dog down once a week for a pup cup so I could take a picture with them and post them on my social media. In about six months' time, we were able to get nine of the dogs adopted. The posts would get thousands of shares. The new management does not find ways to find these dogs' homes. Instead, they are doing quite the opposite by keeping them and not letting them be adopted. My sister was doing meet and greets with her dogs and Cooper, which was one of the ones that were killed, and the management was aware. On May 31st, my sister had asked to adopt Cooper, and they told her he was on hold pending a behavioral assessment. They had Cooper locked up for four months longer and then killed him. Cooper was a good dog. I did meet him. He was like a big, cuddly teddy bear. Um, my sister has adopted dogs in the past with behavioral problems because they were abused or neglected and she had no concerns with Cooper. 
She bought a dog bed and toys for Cooper and now he is gone, along with 12 other dogs and there is going to be another round of dogs to be killed. Something needs to be done now before these dogs follow the same fate as Cooper and the other 12. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah and then Shamra. Is that online? Hannah is online. Is she phone? Does she want to hit Go screen? ahead, Hannah. Hello, everyone. Go ahead. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. I am a concerned member of the city of Spokane, and I am here to provide testimony in support of the new ordinance. What the city has done is disgusting. While I acknowledge that there may be some ambiguous language, I believe it, is, it represents in a positive mood forward. It is unjust for the animals to lose their lives, and we must take proactive measures to ensure those responsible are held accountable. Additionally, I would like to emphasize the necessity of revising our municipal codes, allowing individuals to euthanize animals solely due to the lack of space should not be permitted unless there is clear and convincing evidence that all available resources have been exhausted in finding them suitable placements. Currently, there is too much power with the director to allow euthanization. I ask that new models be looked at and an advisory board be created that is not dictated by scraps as well as community notification before these decisions can be made. These animals did not deserve to die. Please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. And Shamra? Shamra online. Yes. Shamra, go ahead. Oh. Hi. Am I, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. I want to give a shout out to my advocates with Underground Rainbow. My name is Chamber Andrews. I live in the city of Spokane Valley. I am an advocate for the voiceless. I have been involved in personal animal rescue and helping the community of Spokane for a few years now with lost and found pets on social media providing resource information. I am devastated by Scrap's recent euthanasia of dogs. I am opposed to the current management and policies. I am in favor of emergency ordinance um, in your agenda that you can vote on today. I have concern over the verbiage and in the municipal code allowing scrap to kill for capacity. It is very important to align code language and I advocate for aligning contracts and ordinances throughout our communities. I also am in favor of the advisory board. Please help us help the voiceless animals. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That's the end of public comment. How about council commentary? Go ahead. Yeah, well, first off, I just wanna thank everybody who showed up today, uh, took the time. I know it's already after eight and we're not done yet with our agenda, but, um, I know this is a late night for a lot of folks, so I just wanna thank you for that. You know, in February, March of 2020, I had the privilege of bringing forward an amendment to the interlocal agreement with Scraps. Someone's playing with our lights. Uh, well, we'll have a good time on the video here. Um, I, I was privileged to bring forward the, an amendment to our interlocal agreement with Scraps that delineated that they would follow, frankly, the practice they were following at that time under their director, um, which is that uh, unless the animal was, as you heard earlier, um, had an irremediable prognosis as it relates to behavioral health, um, that they would not be put down for these sorts of things. Now, I'm not gonna get into the, the specific details of, of the dogs and things like that that went on last week. There's lots of folks who've reviewed that and anybody can go and review those details. But overall, this process has been really um, frustrating. So uh, following that amendment, um, frankly, we didn't hear a whole lot except for some other issues that we always have to kind of deal with with animal control um, until early this year. And then early this year, suddenly uh, a spike of commotion both uh, to us as council members on social media around some perhaps changes in how Scraps was operating. 
And um, prior to that, February, we had reached out to the Scraps leadership, invited them to come uh, to our public safety meeting. They accepted. Uh, shortly before they, they said they couldn't make it, okay, and so we rescheduled for the next month. Um, that one, they didn't even show up to that meeting. Uh, and then we scheduled yet another in May, and at 6 a.m. on the day of, which is also right around when some of these uh, issues were being raised, uh, they again said that they would not come and attend. And so three, three attempts we made to bring them in and have a conversation, really just to build a relationship talk about how you know we saw we see things we'd like to work together um, I had a great relationship with the previous director and we wanted to continue that and so unfortunately that didn't happen well we soon then councilmember Stratton myself legal um, I think our city administrator at the time uh, we sat down with scraps leadership and had a pretty intense conversation and uh, there was no resolution out of that conversation it was a very intense one um, but we made it pretty clear our, our views and we expected that the contract amendment that had been unanimously passed by this city council, unanimously affirmed by the county commission would be followed. And that's when it was brought to our attention that the county maintains this code that allows them to kill for capacity. And so that began the, this conversation. We then met with a couple of county commissioners uh, in the month of July. Um, we followed that up with a letter dated July 6, and from then it was silent. And our city legal attempted multiple times to communicate with the county's legal team, um, but there really was never any updates. And so finally we got to a point where we decided it was time to move forward with our ordinance that we had actually presented to the county at that meeting. Um, we've obviously tweaked it and made some changes, and by the way, we're not done yet, um, but the, um, so we, we introduced it, we brought it forward, and then it was six days later that they announced that they had uh, destroyed these animals. And so heartbreaking, um, the lack of communication, the lack of partnership, the lack of just exchange has been incredibly infuriate, infuriating uh, for me. This is an important issue. Um, I, I think animal control is something that everybody expects to be done right, and frankly, I think most people expect it to be done ethically. And that's what we want and what we demand. And so um, as a part of these um, interactions, the county had thrown out, well, let's reconstitute the advisory board. So this was an advisory board. It doesn't have a lot of teeth. It provides a little bit of oversight, but they really don't have any function that they can enforce anything. Um, but it was being reconstituted. And so we're in the process now of talking about who might be appointed to that. Um, but the request, the invitation was that the first meeting of this advisory board would be in October. So wouldn't you expect that a significant decision like this might be held until an advisory board could get together and at least talk? Um, now that's not exactly the purview in the ILA and that's one of the things we're working on. We still hope to meet with the county, work with the county uh, on a regional solution because our code uh, change here while uh, does some good, it does not address the entire issue and it only really addresses a small issue for the city. It doesn't affect other jurisdictions. And so there's still a lot more that needs to be done, I believe, on this issue. Uh, the best outcome is a regional solution, which I think is the truth on a lot of things. And, um, and so we're, we're working towards that uh, end goal and I believe we're still committed to trying to make that work. But in the meantime, it's important that we move forward and make these changes um, to, to interject the protections that we, that we can. And our powers are fairly limited in this situation, but we are continuing to explore a number of other options uh, as well as we move forward. And so we welcome any input from folks um, who are out there. And then the last thing I would just want to double down on is, you know, we, I have heard reports of a lot of folks who work for scraps, who have been mistreated, uh, folks in the community see them, they don't treat them respectfully, they think that maybe they're behind some of these decisions. And I just want to assure you, the folks working at Scraps are doing the best they can. They are working hard, trying to do the best by our community. And those sorts of interactions just don't, don't help. It really hurt, harms morale. It, and, and they're not the ones responsible for these sorts of things. And so I would just encourage the community, the public, you know, just please, when you see a Scraps uh, employee, you know, please treat them with respect because you know they have a very, very difficult job and it really only makes it a lot more hard. So I will leave it there and of course I will be supporting this tonight. Go ahead, council member. Thanks. Um, I wanna thank council member Cathcart and his legis legislative assistant, Shay. They have put 
their heart and soul into all of this work, and I am just grateful to be part of it. I did want to clarify um, for people that I've talked to in the last few weeks, this is a, a big group of people that have been contacting us. And sometimes out when I'm out in the community, somebody will say, well, you've got five or six people that are, you know, causing trouble and stirring things up. It's not five or six people. It is hundreds of people that we have heard from, and the stories are all similar. So I want to be really clear that we are trying very hard to listen to everybody. But frankly, the majority of voices we're hearing, and there are hundreds of them, are asking us to make this change. So I want to be clear on that publicly. I also want to be clear on, there was a quote in the paper saying that, you know, we're bringing this up, but Councilmember Cathcart and myself have, have never been to Scraps. Um, I have not. They did invite us. I did not go because I know that if I went, I would have a car full of animals <laughs> going home. But I also believe in the people that I know who have visited Scraps, who have had those interactions, including City Council staff. So I'm guilty I did not go to Scraps and visit, um, and that was for those reasons. So I support this. I am happy to, to start or to have conversations with the county. Maybe this will help move things along. We have not been successful in the last months trying to get something together with the county that we can all sit down and agree on. I'm open to that, but I care about what you think. I care about these animals. I care about the people working at Scraps, and I really think we should all be working together, and there are enough agencies and organizations that we could be plugging into to take those animals that um, aren't, aren't doing well at Scraps, and let's see where else we can get them before we make those decisions to euthanize them. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Councilmember Cathcart. Um, this has been really sad, but it's, there's something very um, um, enduring about us sitting here tonight and talking through these issues, and I really do appreciate it. Go ahead. I'll say I did go to Scraps, and I almost came home with a puppy, and my wife was like, don't you, don't you come home with that puppy. So um, I, uh, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. There are a lot of questions that need to be answered, and uh, I know that the county um, has recently reached out to us, and I know that those conversations are going to be coming, and I look forward to the outcome of those uh, discussions. Um, I, in the past, have done... Um, work with scraps uh, to help them raise money for their organization and in the future we may again so tonight i will be abstaining from this vote but um, i appreciate all the all the effort that everybody's put into it anybody else I, just a quick call. thank you and and truly thanks to council member cat cart and um, stratton who did the heavy lifting on this and to all the people who came up and spoke in the passion around pets and the care of pets. I have a girlfriend who has five dogs. I don't know how she does it, but that's, those are her children, and that's how she treats them, so I understand the love. We did get uh, communications from the county today, and they are talking about dispute resolution because this is a legal contract, and as Councilmember Cathcart said, what we do tonight will only impact within the city. It will not impact any other areas currently, and there are still more questions to be answered. So I'm in support, but as we go forward, we may be in litigation over this and really what that looks like for our city. So just want to put that out there. But the county did say they want to come and speak to council at a study session in the near future, and we look forward to that and then how we go for it from that point on. Thank you. Anybody else? One more thing, real quick. I just want everybody to know that I forgot, but I have my lucky poodle socks on tonight. Okay. So, Thanks for good. sharing that. Yes. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show everybody after the meeting. Okay, great. Looking forward to that, too. Oh my goodness. Okay, uh, prepare to vote. Great. Good job. Thank you. Uh, let's take about a 10-minute break. We've been sitting here for almost two and a half hours, and these chairs 
were purchased in the 1970s. <laughs> so let's take 10 minutes. Uh, let's actually, let's come socks? back at 8.30. Huh? So when did you get your socks? Well, I've had them. I have three pairs of school socks. But this one really looks like this. Oh, can I go take a nap now?
11 people is 90 minutes. Please. Hello. Please sit down, everyone. We're going to resume. Please take your seats. Ms. Fister, we're going to do um, the small ordinances first, 0082. Which one? 0082. Okay. I did. All person order. We're starting. Okay, I've got notes too. We can talk All right, about them. So uh, just hold on. Okay. We're going to do some of the little ones first before we get to our uh, big resolution and they shouldn't take long. There's no um, public commentary and there'll be very little council commentary. So Ms. Fister, would you please read 0082? Resolution 2023-82 calling for the establishment of a joint task force to develop and implement a Spokane Independent Inspector General. Okay, and this was talked about um, some years ago. It's been resurrected by Council Member Cathcart. I'm co-sponsoring this. I think there was a, was there a third co-sponsor or not? Okay, just the two of us. I think I was a co-sponsor. Well, I thought Council Member Bingle was. But. Are you co-sponsor? Nope. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, great. Uh, commentary by Council. All right, prepare to vote. Thank you. And uh, next would be the, let's see, uh, 0083. Resolution 2023-83, amending the appointments of council members to boards and commissions. And so when uh, council member Orlick came on board, we rearranged our boards and commissions because we were all, we, ought, we had too many and we felt like we wanted to share the love. So we gave you some. <laughs> Thank you. And so we're now voting on those appointments. Any council commentary? All right, great, prepare to vote. Thank you. And then we already did the vacation, so let's do um, 36439. Ordinance C36439, providing an increase in city business registration fees, amending Spokane Municipal Code Section 8.02.0206A and 8.02.0206B of the Spokane Municipal Code, deferred from September 18, 2023 agenda. Okay. So this is recognizing that for the year or so of COVID, we suspended uh, license, business license fees. They're back now and we're asking, the administration is asking us to um, put in a small accelerator for inflation. So we're uh, honoring that request. Any council commentary? All right, thank you, prepare to vote. Okay, and we have uh, six, six one. Is that right? Yeah, mm -hmm. good. And next would be the four four zero. Ordinance C thirty six four forty relating to noise control amending Spokane Municipal Code section thirteen point zero two point zero three ten to chapter thirteen point zero two, and amending Spokane Municipal Code section ten point seventy point zero forty to chapter ten point seventy of the Spokane Municipal Code and setting an effective date deferred from September 18, 2023 agenda. Okay, and this is about um, solid waste, collecting at six instead of seven, and um, it, th this is about noise control because they can be quite noisy, but they are exempted, so we're amending the SMC to accommodate that. Any, com any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. Thank you. And then the um, first reading ordinance, please. Ordinance C36444 relating to the regulation of massage and re reflexology businesses and establishing a process for the denial or revocation of business licenses due to illegal activity. Adopted a new chapter 10.78, amending chapter 8.01 by adding a new section 8.01.320 and amending section 4.04.050 of the Spokane Municipal Code. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinance. Okay, good. And then do you want to go back up to the um, 0081? Resolution 2023-81, formally denouncing Mayor Nadine Woodward's actions that affiliated the city of Spokane and its residents with former Washington State Representative 
and identified t domestic terrorist Matt Shea and known anti-LGBTQ extremist Sean Foyt. Um, just reminding you of the rules of decorum here. And there is no clapping, no cheering, no booing, no public outbursts. We are going to treat each other with mutual respect. The uh, security is prepared to remove people who are disruptive from the council chambers. And as you know, I will not hesitate to ask them to do so. So let's just keep it nice and civil. So we have quite a few. In fact, we have 32 people signed up. And um, what we need to do, council, is determine we have approximately an hour until our meeting ends. So before we start doing this, we need to determine we're going to go past 10 o'clock. Um, by motion, I need to know if that's what you want to do or if you want to limit people's testimony to two minutes. I'd make a motion to extend. You make a motion to what? You need extend. to speak. Motion to extend. To? To allow the speakers who are here to, to speak. Extend to what? How long? Un until we finish the... Okay. Yeah. And you want three minutes? You three, okay. Is there a second for that? Council President, real quick. Yes. Our council rules just ask for a motion to um, extend to a certain time. It's kind of specific about that. We have 32. That's an hour and a half. So motion to extend to 1015. Taking consideration okay. council comment. Yeah, commentary. Okay, motion to extend to 1030. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? So we'll be here for 10.30. Hope you brought your pillows and blankets. Good. Um, first up is Terry Hill. And let's be ready to go, please. First up is Terry Hill, then Reginald Camps, then Tom Robinson. Thank you. Still Terry Hill, still longtime resident of Spokane. The mayor's appearance at said event was an embarrassment to our city. The mayor insults the intelligence of our community when she says, gosh, I didn't know what type of event this was. This coming from someone with years of experience in the media industry. She states that she didn't know in advance that Matt Shea would be at this, this event. But she should have been able to figure that one out when she stood next to him at the, at the event. At that point, she made a choice. She could have turned around and walked off that stage. She didn't. Tonight, this council is faced with a choice. Do you say, ah, shucks, that's OK if our mayor pals around with an alleged domestic terrorist? Or do you stand with your community and say, in Spokane, we are better than this. Your vote tonight will be a repeat. For some of you, your vote tonight will be a repeat of statements that you've made earlier. And that's OK. That's what your community wants to hear. For others who can't seem to support this, well, that says something about you, too. Your vote tonight will be, a, will be part of your legacy, will be part of the legacy of your time on this council. Vote wisely. With that, I yield the podium. Thank you. Reginald Camps, Tom Robinson, Nancy Polson. All right, thank you for having me tonight. I'm Reginald Camps. I am a resident of Spokane. So in, in regards to denouncing Mayor Woodward, I, I enjoyed the previous conversation about community because, well, at this worship event, and I'm going to say this again, a worship event, this, Spokane has a significant Christian community. And this was an event where we are talking about alleged terrorists being there, about anti-LGBTQ um, extremists. Well, I was there. I've heard things like white nationalists added to this. 
Well, as you see in front of me, obviously that's not very true. I've been to three of these events. What I, what I have seen at these events is children going before the altar, teenagers going before the altar. I've seen them give them their lives to Christ. I've seen them decide to choose a moral high ground, the same high ground that so many of you, even if you don't believe in the same God that I follow, that I know to be true, that we desire for our children. I know that our mayor went to this event and led teenagers, and I'm going to say this again, thousands of teenagers in caring for their fellow man, praying for them who had just had a tragedy happen in their lives. So I have no idea about the divisiveness of the idea to denounce our mayor and going to an event where a bunch of Christians who support this city, who want to see well in this city, how do you do not see that that causes a division here and now? And that's not even to mention what it says for us as Christians being able to stand up and speak for what we feel is right. If the leaders in our city cannot support us, but they can support just about every other group here, that is, that just pushes me back. I I just, I'm at a loss for words at this. You know, you, you claim you want people to have freedoms. I have been labeled a white nationalist. I want to explain this because I have family that shares my ethnic background. You want to talk about divisions in family? You want to talk about divisions in people? This is what you're bringing about. This is the initiation of what you are bringing into the city. So that's what you need to think about when you choose to make this vote. You need to think about the benefits that came of this instead of focusing on what you feel is the negative. Because, all right, it will be your legacy. What are you going to usher in in the city of Spokane? the city that I have grown to love over the past 10 years. And that's what I got. Thank you. Um, Tom Robinson, Natalie Polson, and Rick Matter. Okay, let's get clear about what this issue really is. This is not about religious persecution which has been claimed in the press. This is not about praying, which has been claimed. This is not about exercising First Amendment rights. This is a social justice issue, and the reason why it's a huge issue is it has to do with homophobic people who are so far extremist right religiously that they advocate for eliminating persons uh, who are uh, LGBTQ. Not not just uh, uh, hate the sin, love the sinner, or whatever they say. Eliminating. Now, that, that's, the, that's the real issue here. And I want to talk about three people who are involved and intertwined with this issue. Of and, course, we know Matt and, Shea. So and, we're going to be careful when you start naming people, please. Yes. Matt Shea, Sean Foyt, and uh, they associate w- both of them with Caleb Collier. Those are the three people that are intertwined on this issue. And it, uh, they have uh, several organizations that work together. Foyt has one called Let Us Worship, and uh, there's another one uh, that... Uh, Collier has, but I want to read to you about what Mayor Woodward should have known because this was published in Range News Media the Friday before the event she went to. And so the news media had this information available, and here's what they wrote. Let Us Worship is a national tour of Christian concerts founded by the far-right celebrity worship leader Sean Foyt. After appearing in Spokane, Foyt tweeted that thousands of unified believers had attended the Spokane event. The Friday before the Let Us Worship rally, Range published a story describing the planned event and detailing the connections between Shea, Foyt, and 
Turning Point USA Faith, which is where Caleb Collier comes in here, is I understand that he is somehow connected with uh, one of two entities, Turning Point USA or Turning Point USA Faith. Now, uh, Caleb Collier has been uh, buddies with Matt Shea for a long time. I've seen them at uh, many events uh, where the protesters and counter-protesters were there. Uh, a Tom, time's up. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, Natalie, sorry. Natalie um, Polson, Rick Matter, and Dave M is still uh, virtual, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's some specific points that I would like to have on record and heard by all. The first is each one of you took an oath, and that oath says, support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I won't read the oath in its entirety, but the oath means you are to uphold the First Amendment, which states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to peaceably to assemble. This means the people have a right to assemble, a right to pray. That includes a mayor's right to assemble and pray. The oath of office includes our Washington State Constitution, so let's review Article 1, Section 4. The right of petition and of the people peaceably to assemble for the common good. Your constituents have a right to peaceably assemble. And to those that believe in God, prayer is the common good. Article 1, Section 11 says, Absolute freedom of conscience in all matters of religious sediment, belief, and worship shall be guaranteed to every individual, and no one shall be molested or disturbed in person or property on account of religion. That statement shows you should vote this resolution down tonight and stop wasting our tax dollars for your obvious political stunts because there is an upcoming election in November. You are trying to denounce a mayor, a woman of faith, for attending a prayer event. Shame on you for attacking the First Amendment right that you swore to uphold. I ask the council, when did you decide to persecute people of faith? Are we not clearly allowed to gather, worship, and pray? I pray, and I am a Christian. Will I be the next individual attacked because of my faith? If we can denounce or censure a mayor for prayer, who will be next? Our First Amendment right protects everyone of every faith and every background. It gives us the ability to have freedom of speech and to share our views here in America without persecution. But what seems to be taking place in Spokane is a council who will bully its residents into silence. I ask you, is this, does it move us forward who will be next? This isn't about the mayor, but about a council using its authority to violate an oath you swore to uphold. All this began because the mayor was seen on stage with an individual certain members of the council dislike, Matt Shea. Council members opponent in an interview, this is about a mayor being affiliated with an individual who was accused of domestic terrorism. Can you help me understand why an elected official or any person, for that matter, becomes affiliated with another individual just by sharing the same space? There is a point of alleged versus convicted. An allegation does not mean proven guilty in a court of law. Last I checked, we are a country of innocent till proven guilty. You keep saying accused terrorist. That's not guilt. Natalie, time's up. Thank you. And media, I have the rest of it here with me. Rick Matter, Dave Am, and then Lyle Dash, I think. Rick Matters. Uh, Resident of Spokane, I thank you all. Uh, council members, I thank those who are here and those who have spoken. I have a letter from 44 uh, Christian, mainly Christian pastors, um, and it uh, suggests an alternate, alternate path here. It's very brief, and then I'm going to make some comments afterwards. Thank you to the mayor who received a copy of this letter. You all received one, but only today, so it's probably in your inbox. Uh, thank you, Mayor and City of Spokane Council members for the privilege of speaking uh, to you about the concern of the faith leaders and leaders of conscience in eastern Washington and north Idaho. Um, I'm a 
Christian pastor. I'm a member of the Episcopal Church and bring you this message on behalf of the coalition. We seek a statement from the city council that denounces any advocacy, support, participation, or endorsement from any group that is involved in Christian nationalist or white supremacy ideology or um, Christian dominism. Can't say that very well. We expect leadership, uh, <coughs> leaders who attend a meeting that has been advertised for three months to know the meeting that was not a simple gathering for a current event. We expect a leader to leave immediately should they find themselves accidentally part of something that masks uh, a hateful ideology uh, and concern for wildfire victims, etc. Using the grieving and hurting people of our community as a child is unaccept as a shield is unacceptable. Here's our ask. We ask that you as a city council develop and uh, come to agreement on such a statement to be part of the code of ethics for the city leadership. Um, and um, so thank you again. And uh, as I say, you have a copy with all of our names on it already. <clears throat> My comments are, um, First, that there is a rally, there was a rally upstairs, it's probably past now, uh, to support uh, freedom of worship, um, and I support that. In fact, we, when we said the pledge today, we were pledging the Constitution and the, and the right to gather and the right to worship, and um, so I celebrate that as a Christian pastor. I mean, might even say hallelujah to that. Um, and... Um, um, Lost my train of thought there. Um, uh, the issue f for me is that uh, if you go to YouTube and look at the story behind Matt Shea's inquiry, which was done by the uh, county sheriff, so oh, am I running um, out of time? You're out of time. Sorry. Okay, man. When I preach, time just goes longer. <laughs> right? Yes. I get it. Thank you. As, as a pastor's son, no statement could be truer than what he just said, let me tell you. Just, yeah, keep talking. You don't have a time That's right. All right. Um, Dave M., you want to press star three? Go ahead, Dave. Thank you. Uh, council Dave M. Spokane. At prior council meetings, two council members, one of which is running in this year's election, brought forward a resolution to censor now labeled denouncing the mayor for attending an event, a prayer, a prayer meeting she attended on her own time. It was said by the council members bringing this to the floor, quote, that no one should be targeted in Spokane, unquote. I guess that doesn't apply to the mayor or any person or citizen that the majority on the council doesn't like or simply disagrees with. The mayor didn't and wasn't targeting anyone. The mayor was on her own time. As the council president stated in one of the prior meetings, quote, this seems like piling on. It does seem political, unquote. She even asked, quote, what do you hope to gain by this, unquote. Quote, an election year stunt, unquote. This is nothing more than a political hit job, plain and simple. The council must not condone this targeted behavior from two of their city council members. I would ask, is this council legally allowed to go after and target what people do on their own time? KXLY reported last week the same two council members are trying to bring a council measure against the badly needed measure number one, attempting to once again silence the people's voice. If that wasn't enough, CREM2 reported just this weekend that these same two council members want to waste more time and tax dollars to rehash the already finalized Johnny Perkins matter. I would ask, why is it always the same council members trying to bring our city down? The hits, political hits, just keep on coming from the same members. It's starting to look like these two council members may be crossing the line into recall territory. They may also be violating the city ethics code by targeting a citizen. And yes, the mayor is also a citizen and has First Amendment rights. 
This further confirms how badly we need fresh new leadership from the outside. Enough is enough. To the public, please check out www.ontheball509.com for information you won't get from the local news. You can also email gooseforthegander at gmail.com. That's goose, the number four, the gander at gmail.com. If you have any questions or information you would like to share, they will do their best to respond to your request or direct you to someone who can answer. Thank you, Council. I appreciate your attention in this matter, and I urge you to vote no. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Lyle MJ, Lyle Dash, MJ Bolt, Caleb Collier. Good evening, City Council. My name is Lyle Dack. I'm a family man, a business owner, and a local member of a church in the Spokane Valley. Uh, two weeks ago, I came before the City Council and shared my alarming concerns with the current direction of the Spokane City Council with censure and now denouncing. I want to be clear, we consider that both one and the same. Uh, the mayor, uh, denouncing the mayor for merely praying at a religious concert. I also shared with you a spokesman article dated September 5th where Zach Sapone stated, leaders must stand against hate. I then went on to tell you about the good things I personally witnessed at the event and after that asked you to define what is a Christian nationalist because I myself do not know. I asked to show me the bigotry, show me the racism, show me the detriment this brought our communities. I asked how this doesn't heal a community in a positive way. Why are you condemning good? In a recent spokesman article, as we just heard, dated 913, Council President Lori Kinnear states, the censure goes too far. The community already knows where we stand. This seems like piling on. It does seem political, and it does seem like an election year stunt, quite frankly. Council members Betsy Wilkerson and Zach Sapone are still calling on the city council to formally denounce the mayor. Sapone also stated in a recent news uh, interview with KHQ, we in the faith community might, not under, uh, might be confused about the word censure versus censuring, but I tell you, we in the faith community are not confused. We understand clearly what is happening here and the permanent implications this can have on one person. And we are still waiting for the count, city council to show us the evidence of wrongdoing. And we would like definitions to the terms that you like to label people with, especially the ones being used against the mayor. But we've heard nothing and we've seen no proof. Therefore, we advise the mayor to do exactly the opposite. Mayor, do not apologize for joining us in prayer. Rather, embrace your faith publicly and stand for those of us that are under pressure to conceal our faith in order to avoid offending others. Mayor should not apologize. The city council members, Wilkerson and Zapone, still calling for the formal denounce slash censure of the mayor should apologize. They should also, also apologize for making this a political and wasting the time of the citizens, the taxpayers, and other city officials. This action of denounce and censure presents a clear violation of Article 1, Section 11 of the Washington State Constitution and the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, whereas both protect and guarantee our personal and public religious freedoms to be maintained. Furthermore, we citizens demand an immediate cease pursuing these fictitious labels to denounce or censure of an innocent person, potentially causing them long-term damage to an individual good name and reputation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, MJ Bolt, Caleb Collier, and Marshall Casey. Good evening. Chair Kinnear, City Council members, uh, my name is MJ Bull and I'm from Spokane Valley. And Council Member Ryan Ulrich, great to see you. Congratulations on your appointment. Um, I'm here tonight to urge you to vote no on this uh, resolution. I wear many hats in our community. Uh, one of them is I'm on the State Board of Education. I'm one of the Eastern Washington elected represent representatives on that board. I formerly am a school board member uh, from uh, Spokane Valley. And right now, the hat I'm wearing tonight explicitly is that I am vice chair of the Spokane GOP um, and acting chair. So I'm speaking to you uh, tonight as that. Uh, you all have taken an oath of office 
to uphold the constitutional freedoms of the United States of America, as well as the Washington State Constitution. And you, I feel, are in jeopardy of violating these constitutional freedoms uh, that are awarded to us by our state and our uh, federal government. It is, uh, it's a scary, slippery slope when you say maybe for you know, some people, but not for others. Even our mayor has those rights. And if we violate those rights, if this body violates those rights, then is it me next? So I ask you to vote no. I also um, think that we're on slippery slope. You all are a slippery slope because you are a legislative body, right? And yet you seem to be making a judicial judgment by this resolution. You're, you're playing judge and jury, uh, assigning guilt when there hasn't been due process around these alleged and accused uh, that has been stated in this resolution. So I think that is a, a serious, uh, dangerous zone to, for this body to be going towards. I ask that you don't play judge and jury. I ask you that you leave that up to the judicial courts to do that and stick to the legislative. I want you to know that this is personal for me. I was there with my two older sons. It was an amazing time. And it was a beautiful time, a, a passionate time that all felt welcome. There was no hate there. And it just is sad that we have this legislative body that's trying to denounce this and make people feel bad for being there. Like has been spoken before, I think there's a lot of good that can come from this. I saw kids throwing substances up on the stage. I saw kids that are reeked with mental health pro you know, challenges and problems. We know, you know uh, suicide is skyrocketing in our youth. And there they were, and tears streaming down their face, including my own and my kids. So I ask you to stand for our constitutional freedoms, for our state constitutional freedoms, and vote no on this. Don't go down this slippery slope that you're heading towards. Don't start with a mayor and then end up you know, putting us all in that box. I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Caleb Collier, Marshall, Casey, J. McPherson. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Caleb Collier. Uh, thanks to Tom Robinson, you already heard some of my resume. Uh, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson wrote in the To the Danbury Baptist that in America there would always be a wall of separation between church and state. It was assurance to our country that we would never have a state-controlled church. This is what brought the pilgrims to America. They wanted religious freedom, and they didn't want a state-sponsored church like the Church of England. The First Amendment states, Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That statement is directed at you, the government. Something, by the way, that you took an oath to uphold and defend. Do you declare your, or sorry, when you attempt to censure or denounce an individual who attended a Christian worship service, you're attacking our faith. Do you declare yourselves enemies of Christianity? Romans 12.20 states, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him drink. I happen to know what you hunger for and what you thirst for. And it is freedom. Freedom that can only be achieved through Christ. And so I come to offer you that freedom. I want to offer you, the city council, an opportunity to partake in communion. Now, if you are not Christians, this does not apply to you yet. But for those that declare themselves followers of Christ, and I know there are some on this council that do, then let us unite as we engage in this sacred custom. And I bring these as a gift to you, and I'm going to leave them here. But I have one for each and every one of you and one for myself. So if there are any among you who find yourselves to be Christians and would like to partake, then I would say this bread is his body and is given to us, and this wine is his blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of the forgiveness of sins. So with the time that I have remaining, the offer stands to all of you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And Marshall Casey, 
Marshall Casey, Jay McPherson, and Tatiana, can't pronounce the last name, sorry. You know, I think back to the last time I was in this chamber and you guys were voting on whether or not to settle a lawsuit that I brought on behalf of my client for you violating his constitutional rights. This is not, let me keep this clear, this is not a political stunt. This is you acting underneath the color of law. And everyone has stood up and talked about Mayor Woodward's rights. But I'm going to talk to you about, and, and I want to thank Mr. Robinson for pointing this out. It is not just Mayor Woodward. You are being asked to say that private citizens of Spokane, if they think differently than you, should not be in contact with our elected officials. I think one minister here just said you should adopt his religion that when you hear something that violates what his religious views are, you should leave the room. You know, each one of you has a right. And Zach, it's interesting, someone came to me and asked me to put in something that may violate your right to freedom of speech, and I said no. Could you please direct your comments to the chair, which would be me. Okay. Because I believe in freedom of right, in freedom, I believe in liberty. We all just took that oath. There was a, I saw you guys fold up the piece of paper that was handed out by the GOP. There's a comment on there. If you open it up, yeah, flip to the back page. If you open it up, it's a clear comment and clear statement by our Supreme Court that if there is one fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no officer higher petty has a right to describe what is orthodox in religion, politics, or other matters. You're being asked here today to decide, not as persons, not as individuals. You can do that. Some of you have spoken out as individuals, and I, I think that's appropriate. You're being asked as city council members, as government officials, to act under the color of law and say what is orthodox. Say that Matt Shea should not be talked with, that Sean Fuchs should not be prayed with, because you don't find them to be orthodox. You know, it's interesting that you say Matt Shea should be treated that way because of his other beliefs, but what about his beliefs in dogs? Are you criticizing him for that too? I show you a picture of my dog being hugged by Matt Shea. Are you going to censure him too? You know, it's kind of silly. This whole thing's silly. But you're acting under the color of law. Ask why you're doing this. It's because they, everyone wants the color of law to say what's orthodox. And that's immoral. And it violates your oath. It violates the Constitution. Please don't do it. And your time's up. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Jay McPherson, Tatiana, and Silas. Can't pronounce your last name either. Sorry. When I saw that the mayor could be censured or denounced for being at this meeting, I felt they, I was going to be denounced because I passed through a church and we announced it to our congregation and had a great turnout. So I'd like to comment on the whole resolution, but I'll focus on the 12th paragraph, which reads, whereas on August 24, 2023, the Spokane City Council received a letter from a collective of Spokane faith leaders in which they call on the Spokane City Council to hold fast to the separation of church and state, reject attempts to cloak bigotry and religious language, and make clear that civic leaders give no support to the ideology of Christian nationalism or white supremacy. In reality, who is not holding fast to the true meaning of separation of church and state? Who is truly attempting to cloak bigotry in religious language? And what is Christian nationalism? What do, those who put, what do those who put on that 21st worship service have to do with white supremacy? Nothing. 
You heard it from Reggie, you heard it from others. Whoever wrote this resolution is simply lying. White supremacy? We hate white supremacy. I testify that all that I know who were there and myself would not tolerate white supremacy. If we thought any of the people putting that on were white supremacists, we would not be there. But that's in this resolution. Clearly, these politicians and faith leaders will so easily lie and slander to help their agenda. So in reality, who is not holding fast to the true meaning of the separation of church and state? It's already been mentioned. President Jefferson's principle of a wall of separation between church and state is not violated by a mayor going to a citywide church gathering. However, if civil government representatives abuse their power to denounce someone for going to a worship service, they most certainly are violating the principle of separation of church and state. I hope you can see the hypocrisy. And who is using a derogatory slur, religious bigotry? I think the phrase Christian nationalism, has, Christian nationalism has become a derogatory slur. I don't believe there was any religious liberty, or excuse me, religious bigotry, bigotry at that citywide multi-denominational service. But here it is in the resolution. It seems to be a double standard. Christian nationalists, I don't know what that is. It seems to be the basis of why you denounce people you disagree with, but you never define the term. Maybe people who love God, love their neighbors, and love their nation, are they Christian nationalists? Maybe it's people who believe that God created us in his image, male and female. Maybe those are Christian nationalists. Or maybe it's something else. I had been a pastor very long, about two and a half years ago, somebody emailed me from a, a national website news service that they were doing an article on Christian nationalists and they wanted to know if I'd be interviewed. Well, I'd never heard of the term Christian nationalist before. So I replied back, I'm not sure I'm the right person for this interview. What do you define as a Christian nationalist? And she replied back, you know, those who uh, try to force Christianity on others because, uh, through the power of the state. <laughs> I'm not that at all. Please. Uh, your time oh, no. is up. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Uh... Tatiana, Silas, and then Will Hewlings. Good evening. I'll share three things. First, there are two divisive statements being made. The first claims that council members Wilkerson and Zapone are trying to censor the Mayor Woodward for publicly praying for the victims of the recent fires. The second statement claims that the mayor and Shay are now in cahoots because they shared a stage for a moment. Both those statements are divisive, polarizing, and false. <coughs> to my second point, whose words are you going to believe? Mayor Nadine Woodward, who has been criticized by both sides of the aisle, including the Shea supporters for not catering to their viewpoints more and staying neutral to serve all the citizens of Spokane, I personally don't always agree with the mayor, but acknowledge that she was not elected to only represent me and my viewpoints, or will you believe Matt Shea, who is widely known for his radical views. The mayor says she didn't know Shea would be there, and she doesn't support him. Shea says she did know, and he is shocked that she would say otherwise. I can confidently say I received an invitation to the event, and even though I wasn't planning to attend anyways, I didn't see Matt Shea mentioned on the flyer, nor did anyone mention he would be involved. Based on character alone, I would trust the mayor, but even more so based on my firsthand experience with Shay, after which I wouldn't trust him with my goldfish, let alone what he publicly claims. Lastly, an election is right around the corner. Both Wilkerson and Zapone have endorsed Mayor Woodward's opponent, so when they are asking for this denouncement of the mayor, it has the appearance of bias. If the mayor acted wrongly, I would expect her to be held accountable. She didn't, and so there is no substantial action to be taken. Yet we are still here participating in what to many appears as something politically motivated. The people of Spokane need many things, and a denouncement of the mayor from her political opponents isn't one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Silas? Is Silas here? Silas on the line? Yes, Silas is online. Silas, could you press star three? He has. Go ahead, Silas. Okay. <clears throat> so
Silas, you're unmuted. Go ahead. We can hear you now, Silas. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry, that's my bad. Um, I don't want to take up your time anymore than I have to. Jacoby, I emailed you a PDF with the petition that I'm here to, to present tonight. I, I can't be there physically because I was warned that for my safety as a trans person, I should stay home. Um, I, myself, I am an advocacy and policy organizer with Spectrum. The petition that we wrote was platformed by PGEL. We received 357 signatures in support of this petition to officially denounce Mayor Woodward. And here's the letter that was signed on to. Quote, we the undersigned wish to express our support of the denouncement of Mayor Woodward on the grounds that her decision to join in prayer with Matt Shea, a local Christian nationalist domestic terrorist at um, gathering let us worship, fails to uphold the separation of church and state as outlined by our democracy, as well as actively undermines her supposed support of the civil rights of the 2S LGBTQIA plus community. Faith leaders came together to write a letter to Mayor Woodward requesting that leaders for the city of Spokane join them in, quote, holding fast the separation of church and state, rejecting attempts to close bigotry and religious language, and making clear that civic leaders give no support to the ideology of Christian nationalism or white supremacy, end quote. Spectrum Center Spokane also wrote a letter to Mayor Woodward, Woodward stating, quote, in light of the impact of your conflicting choices and statements regarding 2S LGBTQIA plus members of the community, we formally request that you, Mayor Nadine Woodward, make a public statement clarifying your intentions and commitment to our civil rights and safety, end quote. According to Range Media, Matt Shea, recognized, uh, recognized domestic terrorist, stated the following before welcoming the mayor onto the stage, quote, Every problem we face in this country, whether it's a bonfire, homosexual marriage, transgender issues, whether we're talking the economy, every single problem in this country has one answer, and his name is Jesus Christ, end quote. Due to the lack of response from the mayor's office, we, the undersigned, call on city council to officially denounce Mayor Woodward. As you now know, we have tried to appeal to Mayor Woodward multiple times, and still her office has not come forward with a statement reaffirming her commitment to the safety and protection of 2S LGBTQIA plus individuals. It's clear she does not care about our safety and is willing to encourage by omission the anti-2S LGBTQIA plus hate that threatens our community members. Thank you. Thank you, Silas. Uh, Will Hewlings, Jennifer Thomas, and Dan DeBoys. Good evening, my name is Will Hewlings, and I live downtown. Well, what's happening to Matt Shea and uh, Sean Foyt, even our mayor, I've had experienced the same thing happen to me. As a minority, I've been attacked by white people, uh, mainly. They'll come up and call me a, a Christian nationalist, a white supremacist, a Nazi, I get up here and I tell you I'm a veteran. I've, I'm a service-connected veteran missing part of my body. And I've been labeled someone that works for your city council. The, the prior uh, city council president told me that you can't control what she does on her free time. She has a page, a drag queen page, that she attacks the mayor, Matt Shea. She's a bigot. Do you know what a bigot is? That's a big word. Look it up. That's exactly what you guys did. Councilman Zapone, if you're going to count, if you're going to denounce, Council President, if you're going to denounce, can we just not yell? Can, hey, can that's how I speak. speak. I'm sorry if you're getting tone. if it yeah. hurts your feelings. You, I've been in front of you a million times, and all you do is yell. So okay, if you, could just you tone said it the down, same thing about my great. friend Justin. Yes. Yes. Look, that's how I speak. And I'm obviously pretty worked up. I'm sick and tired of getting up here and you guys sitting here looking at me, smiling. What do you think about me? Do you call me a white supremacist? We're what? We don't need to listen to you yell at us. Okay, I'm not. You maybe need it, but for no, you to denounce no. and waste our time when there's other things, I get up here and talk about public safety, about people getting attacked. Oh, what does Zapone do? He, 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 he's so worried about 
the LGBTQ? How about me as a normal person? Why is it that their rights are so special? They get a pink flags and all that. That's what it seems like. You guys like to attack people. You created a noise ordinance in 2020, and I do got emails, and it's pretty disturbing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jennifer, Dan Du Bois, and Sherry Barnett. I'm sorry about that. That was. Aggressive. We're used to it. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, in a KHQ interview on September 7th, council member Betsy Wilkerson admonished the Spokane community to not disparage people when they are trying to help their community. She said, quote, I'm calling upon everyone in our city to not disparage those trying to help, but to support them and understand what they do to help make our communities whole. I agree. Sadly, the same, at the same time that Councilwoman Wilkerson was making the statement, she was also busy leading a charge to denounce the mayor for praying for our city. This seems a bit shocking to me, seeing um, it as an obvious contradiction to her reprimanding the community to overlook a recent local nonprofit organization's team building trip to Vegas during the fires. If Councilwoman Wilkerson really wanted people to give others the benefit of the doubt and not disparage them while they're trying to help make the communities whole, then that would apply to Mayor Nadine Woodward as well. Likewise, if she really wanted to hold her peers accountable for the actions that associate them with the bad guys, then she would be leading the charge on Lisa Brown and her association with Michael Pollan, a convicted domestic terrorist um, and attempted murderer. Councilman Jonathan Bingle said, um, the city council has used the censure as a purely political tool. He's quoted as saying in the Spokesman Review interview on September 5th, um, if it were a serious process and we were a serious body, we would have censured Zappone for his gerrymandering, noting Zappone's controversial involvement <coughs> in last year's changing city council district boundaries, but we're not a serious body. And Council President Kinnear, you also were quoted in that same article saying, I'm not sure what's left to say. We've already been on record saying that we believe these things, we support people's diversity, et cetera. How many times do we need to say that um, or reward it? And I agree with that also but somehow it's very political when it comes to the mayor um, praying for her city. And sadly, apparently, it's mob mentality that might rule at the end of the day. Please don't let that happen. Thank you. Uh, Dan, Du Bois, Sherry Barnett, and then Ron McKierney. Thank you, it's uh, Dan Du Bois, and I'm a longtime Spokane resident. Um, let me preface, or preface my comments just with <clears throat> um, just an observance that when you have a really poor argument, when it doesn't stand on its own merit, um, especially these days, especially against Christians, you tend to wrap it in phrases like white supremacy. You wrap it in phrases like Christian nationalist. <clears throat> the argument can't stand for itself, so you've got to wrap it in something that's untrue. I'm struggling to understand how to logically address the council members, Zappone and Wilkinson's request to formally denounce mayor, <clears throat> mayor's attendance at a worship service. You're gonna hear that a few times. It was a worship service. I was there. I was, I was impressed to see the mayor in attendance at the worship service. In the back of my mind as I prayed for her and the other city leaders and others prayed for her and city leaders, at the worship service, I wondered what was, how, what was going to be the fallout? How was this going to be spun by her political opponents? Unfortunately, I didn't have to wait long. The recently passed motto for Spokane, in Spokane, we all belong. The reality is we all belong unless you're a Christian, unless you bow to this council's goat God, and finally, <laughs> unless you attend a worship service. This woke position, this cancel culture groupthink term publicity stunt that the council members Zappone and Wilkinson's perpetuate is exactly what I, as a God-fearing father, warn my children against. You are perfect examples of what has gone terribly wrong for the city today. Public figures that put their political gains above the mayor's attendance at a worship service. Your only concern is how can you leverage everything and everyone to get more votes so you can stay in your position. Shame on you. 
Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 51, Do you think that I come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. The division could not be more clear. As your woke agenda has gathered steam and evil has grown, God's people have awakened, and you've heard them here tonight. We are watching, we are vocal, and we will remember how you vote. Thank you. Uh, Sherry Barnett, Tim McCarney, and, uh, uh, sorry, Ron McCarney and Tim Kinley. Yes, I'm Sherry Barnett. I live in Spokane. Mayor, um, President Kinnear and all members of the city council. This says it's formally denouncing Mayor Nadine Woodward for her actions that associated her with former Washington State Representative and alleged domestic terrorist Matt Shea and known anti-LGBTQ extremist Sean Fort. This whole thing is built on mud. First of all, Matt Shea was never a terrorist. And this council was part of putting a brand on him. He did not deserve this name. And it's been used to harm him. He is one of the gentlest, humblest people. He has been an officer of the United States of America. He's risked his life for us. He was for the people in all the actions that he's accused of doing wrong in. Next of all, Nadine Woodward went to the gay parade because she's mayor of Spokane and she's mayor of everybody. But by the same token, she has a right to worship God and to give praise to him and have prayers given for her. I do hope and pray that she wins this election. You, you here in the majority need to realize a long time ago, George Washington, when he was looking into the future, he said, the great danger he saw was when one party began to be so strong and they began to use the power of the United States government against the other party and to wield all power in their behalf. So I pray you will all do honorably and justly. And denouncing Mayor Woodward will not be that. Thank you. Thank you. Ron McKearney, Tim Kinley, and then Chris McFall. How do you pronounce your last name? McInerney. I got it wrong, sorry. Fourth generation spoken name. Okay. <clears throat> Two of the things that we should all strive for are freedom and unity. I want to read from an excerpt from a speech given 60 years ago by a Baptist preacher at our nation's capital. This is the excerpt. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low and rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out the mountain of despair and a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together to pray together, to struggle together, go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that all we will, that we will all be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, 
sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. Let freedom ring from the stone mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from the lookout mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men, white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Tim, Kinley, Chris McFall, and then Karen Fournier. Council President, council members, um, under the color of law, you know, I checked that out. That's pretty serious stuff. Uh, you got an attorney, uh, check it out. But I also check out potential campaign violations. Because here you got a council member, Mr. Zapone, and you got Betsy Wilkerson, both running for office, working on behalf of... Point of order. Certainly. Uh, there was a statement of fact that I'm running for office. I don't know where that's... I don't know. Can, can you prove that fact? Oh, I can't. I, I guess I thought you were my, my bad. Okay. But acting on behalf of Brown, who's running for mayor, and taking city time Point and resources. Point of order on that. Yes, go ahead. Acting on behalf of Lisa Brown. What, what, how it's my say? opinion. Okay, it's your I, opinion. And I get to share my opinion. Okay, okay thank right. you. It's your opinion, but it's not But I think it's pretty obvious, and I think everybody else here sees that. I mean, it's pretty clear, you know, you're attacking Nadine in the midst of a campaign and that, in your opinion, would benefit. So I want to know how much money's been spent and if there's going to be an in-kind contribution or if there's actual a, a financial donation to uh, Brown's campaign. So you got an attorney, should talk to him, check it out. Um, also, know your community. Um, I, 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 this whole thing here, when you're talking and you have a statement in here that is totally not true, you don't understand the faith-based community. Hundreds of people had to evacuate their homes while, and uh, over the same weekend due to numerous wildfires. Okay, video images of public events show Mr. Fauci, Fauci, sorry, <laughs> called for a fire that would consume Spokane. All you had to do was talk to, and I'm surprised this uh, pastor over here didn't mention it. Everybody in the religious community knows what that is. That's the Holy Spirit coming over the city to bring priests and forgiveness and restoration and to then come and say this. This is slander. It's intentional. You should know that. So where's the trial, Matt Shea? You know, you, you, you want to defame? You know, that's what, that's what you're, in my opinion, what you're doing. You're trying to defame somebody. And you're doing it based on lack of evidence, lack of knowledge, intentionally, and it's got, st it's got to stop. And if I were you, I'd postpone this until you talk to your legal counsel and get that straightened out. Thank you. Chris McFall, Karen Fournier, and Dean McCarty. Good evening, Council President Kinnear. Thank you. And Council members. My name is Chris McFall. I'm a longtime, three decade uh, resident of Spokane. And it's a privilege to be here today. I believe each of you is here serving in your chair and your position with the intent of the well being of Spokane. Thank you for the opportunity. One of the things that makes our community great is the broad range of backgrounds that we represent here together in this room tonight. 
There is strength in diversity. There can be strength in diversity. The irony to me, again, opinion, yes, the irony to me in this vote is that at its core, this vote undermines the very freedom it seeks to protect. The stated issue is protection of the LGBTQIA plus community. The right to live the lifestyle of their choice regardless of the opinion of others. Like you, I support that right. I support Silas's right, who we heard from earlier, to choose his lifestyle. But if you vote to denounce the right to pray, if you denounce the right to be prayed for, you do the exact thing you are voting to denounce. You weaken the fundamental principle of diversity which undergirds the freedom to be gay. This is ironic, but at its core, it is true. Freedom of diversity is inextricably linked to the right to think and act differently, regardless of opinion. One group has the right to be gay. The other group has the right to pray and to be prayed for. This vote, again, at its core, decides if Spokane will now have second-class citizens, those with rights and those with lesser rights. And I don't want to put too fine a point on this, but that's then defined by the Spokane City Council. Who has the right to pray? Who has the right to be prayed for? Please vote no. Embrace the diversity of the Spokane community. Let's protect the rights of those that we agree with and those that we don't. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, Dean McCarty, and then Renee Peterson. <coughs> Council, thank you for this opportunity to let us all speak. Thank you very much, Jonathan. No matter our differences, without a crime being committed, for a sitting council to denounce a sitting mayor right before an election, I think is unconscionable. I wasn't sure what the definition was of especially denounce, so I looked it up, and I hope you did too. Webster's definition of denounce to pronounce publicly, to be blameworthy, or evil. The archaic definition is to announce threateningly, to inform against, uh, to accuse, to announce formally of a termination of something. The definition of censure is a judgment involving condemnation, an official reprimand to find fault and criticize as blameworthy to formally reprimand. Is that your intention? Did you read the definitions? Because this is a very scary thing for me. Like I said, Regardless of our differences, is that what you want to do? This is a very slippery slope, as others have said. She's already condemned the so-called manifesto and didn't know he would be there. I didn't, I, I've attended three or four of Sean's events around the Northwest. I didn't know he would be there either. At most of Sean's events, he has up to 20 local pastors pray for the cities, Kalispell, Seattle, Portland, Spokane. She's a mayor for all, as shown in June, as she should be. Your continued actions here are nothing short of insolence. I'm also concerned with what I've seen before, the people standing with their backs 
to the council and in the rules it talks about having respect for each other. That is not respectful and I would like that to be addressed and considered to not be allowed to happen. I was shocked with the incident at Scraps. I've had a dog since I was five. Our but I also up. would like to know that we're as concerned about killing babies. Time is Thank up. You. Thank you. Uh, Dean McCarty, Renee Peterson, Kim Schmidt. Hi, Dean McCarty, been here since 65, came to go to school at Eastern, became a drug addict. March 1st, 71, at 11 in the morning, I went down to the corner of Maine and Brown, and I was the main meth dealer in Spokane, and it was a uh, Jesus People coffee house. I went in there and they asked me, how can I help you? And I said, well, just pray that Jesus gets me off of meth and the needle. They prayed for me. Uh, I never used again. I never went through withdrawal, and the desire for drugs was gone. I've been sharing that message for over 52 years. I've done every type of ministry, prisons, drug rehab places, mainly in the streets. The last three years, my wife and I have been going down to the city gate, state street, and we'll go down anywhere from 10, we'll probably go down tonight from 10 at night till 2 in the morning, and we sit down and we talk with the street people and the drug addicts. And I never ask them if they're gay. I say, what's your name? And we're getting to know people personally, and there's a sign of revival like there was in the Jesus Revolution. It's ironic that I'm here today. There's about 40 to 50 of its Jesus people on the streets, and the city council tried to get us off the streets. And I'm here, and I'm thanking God that this is happening because Satan works against Jesus. It ain't religious. Religious people hate Jesus. So this is about Jesus and Satan. This is about making a choice between God Almighty and religion. Religion hates God. And uh, I know I, I've done so many ministries with Danny Green and the Family of Faith. I know more evangelists in this town than any of them know. I've done it every part of town. And... Uh, very few churches will do evangelism. I've been to maybe a dozen in, in 30 or years, and I happened to found a church in the pastors, Matt Shea, and we welcomed drug addicts in. This, this Sunday, there was two drug addicts we met on the streets. They came in, and I, I met with them. We love all people. Gay has nothing to do with anything. Sin does. And so I'm just saying uh, this, is, uh, this is good versus evil. There's no in-between. And you may be religious, but if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're, you're, eternal, you're in eternal damnation. So I thank all of you for listening. And we're not bigots. And when you say something about Matt Shea or Sean Foyt, you're talking to me. I've given my life to Jesus Christ, and I, it, I would welcome any of you to come down across from the city gate at night, and we'll sit and we'll talk with these people. They're humans. And we're, there's progress, just like in the Jesus movement. So consider that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Renee Peterson, glasses. Kim Schmidt and Catherine Corrick. Hi. Um, my name is Renee Peterson, and I'm not sure I hearing impaired. So some of what you said, Kinnear, I'm not sure if I'll stay within the rules because I didn't hear. Them. I'll let you know. Don't worry. Okay, okay great. All right. Well, one, I want to say this is my first time here, and I sure didn't plan on being here at this time. <laughs> I, anyway, and my friend, I promised her we'd be out real soon because I thought I was early. But anyway, I, I'm 75. I'm a business owner. I've dealt with lots and lots and lots of people. And the human being 
has lots of conditions. Some are great and some are not. I, I don't know where to go other than I think most everybody here is very courageous. Um, and it's a lot of responsibility you guys have. I feel everyone should be respected no matter what. But when I heard that Nadine Woodward was being asked to denounce her running because she went to a prayer meeting and someone named Matt Shea touched her, I guess, or something, and she was up there. As I understand, she didn't know he was there, and she wasn't asking for his support. In some ways, when the scraps was up before me, I see a correlation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kim Schmidt? She's going to be online. OK. Go ahead, Kim. You're unmuted. Hi, it's Kim from the Valley. Hello. Long time no see. Um, as you guys know, I do work in Spokane, and I shop in Spokane, even though I do live in the Valley. And I've been running a group for many years now called Stronger Together Spokane, which happens to be one of the favorite boogeymen of many of the far-right extremists that has been speaking this evening. Um, back in June of 2020, I had a group of friends and I. We were out in front of City Hall. I'm, I'm sorry, the echo on this phone is terrible right now. Um, but we were out in front of City Hall right as the mayor was walking in. And um, short version of the story, it was right around the time when it was announced that Matt Shea would be taking over Covenant Church. I was able to ask the mayor how she felt about that. And uh, I'm paraphrasing what she said. Um, basically, we thought we were worried about a lot with Ken Peters, but now you have Matt Shea to contend with. I don't know why people associate me with him. I want nothing to do with him. In that same conversation, she turned and pointed to the side of City Hall where the courtyard is there, and she pointed at the pride flag. She said, I, I raised that flag. So that conversation is one thing. At the pride parade this last year, I was the one who handed the mayor the pride flag that she was holding in the car that she was driving in. When I extended my hand to offer her the flag, it crossed my mind. Is she going to take it? Is she going to hesitate? What is she going to do? She grabbed it quickly, no thought to it whatsoever. We have somebody who's claiming to be an ally of the LGBTQIA2 plus community when just a month later, two months later, she's standing on stage with an accused domestic terrorist who had just moments before said anti-gay and anti-trans things on stage. Something doesn't add up here. What I also found interesting is that one of the other people on that stage, who was one of the most eloquent speakers this evening, was standing right next to the mayor. Why wouldn't she want to state that? So this whole false narrative about the mayor is being persecuted for her religious beliefs is ridiculous. We've known for years that Nadine is a Christian. We know what church Nadine goes to. Nobody has ever had an issue with that before because the majority of us do believe in something called freedom of religion. And that's freedom of any religion, not freedom to do anything as long as it falls within the realms of my religion. Okay? So what we have an issue with is the mayor aligning herself with Christian nationalists and far-right extremists. Because back in July 2023, Spokane adopted the motto, in Spokane we all belong. That includes the gay and trans communities. Um, back in 2016, as the um, paperwork for this uh, thing says, uh, Mayor Condon also put through something that referred to Spokane as a compassionate community. What about that Kim, is being compassionate? What about that Kim, is making sure that we all belong? Time's Nothing. Up. And that's why I applaud. Time's up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Catherine, Carson Spratt, and Neelene Du Bois. Neelene, 
boys. Yes. Hello, Councilman Kinnear. Council President Kinnear. Okay, and the rest of you on the council. Okay, my name is Catherine Corrick. I'm a resident of Spokane. And I really wasn't going to, um, wasn't sure what I was going to say tonight until I heard my friend Michael Poland's name mentioned um, with contempt um, by someone who has um, associated him with the mayor's opponent. Okay. Michael lives where I live, at Rockwood Lane. He is one of my dearest friends, as is his wife and his little dog, Scruffy, whom was adopted at Scraps. Okay, Michael made some mistakes when he was younger. I always thought Christianity was about forgiveness and rebuilding your life in a more positive way. Michael has dedicated his life for at least the last 15 years to doing good for our community. And on that basis, I know him as a personal friend, as a kind person, and a person who would never involve himself in some of the things that happened when he was young. So I want to speak out for the concept of forgiveness and going forward and that I think it's lost in the shuffle when we talk about um, the Christian right. And um, I support that. Who among us has not made mistakes in life? And I, for one, have. And I don't think they should be thrown up for someone in the context of a political campaign that had nothing to do with it. I was at the event that Michael was at. I greeted Lisa Brown, I brought her in, she spoke to a hundred people, okay, residents, 55 and up community, okay, of diverse political beliefs. It was a political discussion, it was not a religious discussion. And to see him disparaged by the Christian right for stuff that happened long ago, I just think is wrong. That's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Carson, Spratt, Nailene, Du Bois, and Antoine. Good evening, City Council members. It's been a long night, uh, but I'd crave your full attention, please. Discrimination is life. The man of discriminating taste can distinguish the good quality from the bad. Discrimination is correct judgment to know good from evil and say so. All societies must choose between discrimination and disintegration. Any city must reject wickedness and injustice to thrive. You plan to censure Mayor Woodward. Since you seek to reject some views and promote others, you too discriminate. So do not pretend, as it says on the agenda summary, that you are censuring her for the act of discrimination. Instead, you are censoring her for the appearance of not agreeing with your LGBTQ doctrines. This is not an act of tolerance. This is an act of power. If your power was used well, it would be well, but it is not. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Your judgment is a total moral inversion. In your discrimination, you reject the word of God and all the Christians who believe it completely. The Old Testament says that a man sleeping with a man is an abomination. And the New Testament reiterates the point in both the words of Christ in Matthew 19 and Paul in Romans 1. In Spokane, we all belong. What a bleak lie. Belied by your own actions. You're faced with a choice. Make it clear that everyone belongs by refusing to censure the Christians of Spokane. Or reveal that in your hatred for anti-LGBTQ religions, only those who agree with you do belong. Are you ready to censure the entire history of the Christian church? Be bold. Tell us loudly which religious views you will permit and which ones you will reject. But do not put your hand to the plow against Christianity and imagine that you are making your city a better place. As you vote, feel the weight of what you affirm. Do not say I lightly. Knowingly or not, you are declaring allegiance against the Most High God. I'll quote from Psalm 2. 
Now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. I already know what choice some of you have made in your hearts. You will censure traditional and scriptural Christians for disagreeing with your LGBTQ doctrines. Point of order. Yes, sir. Where does it say that we are censuring Christians? That's what you're doing. You're censuring a Christian. But the only uh, people who will order. leave this room truly that, condemned... That, that, that's not a fact in the document. It says we are You are centering, centering her for her views on LGBTQ apparent opposition. That is a scriptural matter held by the traditional Christian church for over 2,000 years and only changed within the last 50. The only people who will leave this room truly condemned are those who I mean, vote That's inaccurate. I. The document says Mayor Woodward's actions that associated are you, us. Are you, are you, is this my Quiet. time or yours? It's a, it's a point of order. Okay. In our rules, it says that if you make factual statements, we get to ask you where they're at. And right. your factual statement is... I'll take in, my master's of theology against yours. It's inaccurate in the reading of the document. Yes. Do you want to say something? I would say there's a legitimate reading of the document that would say that it's condemning traditional Christian views. Okay. Thank Any, you, Con Councilman else? Bingle. Comment? Please continue. My final point will remain as I already said it. Those who will leave this room condemned by any censure are only those who vote aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nadine Du Bois, Antoine, and George Taylor. <coughs> your first, Antoine, your second. I like you, Bingo. <laughs> like the smartest man up there. <sighs> so I found that it was funny that you cite, recite the Pledge of Allegiance with all of us, but you denounce Christians and God Himself. I'm Point surprised. Of yes. Yes. What? Go ahead. I, I think we need to be clear. This is not denouncing Christians or God. Yes, or God. It is. That, that is very clear in the resolution. We are denouncing Mayor Woodward's actions. That is correct. You're denouncing so, Mayor Woodward for going to a Christian uh, worship but, service. It's not denouncing Christians. Let's, I think let's let her. Clear. You've had your say. Let's let her finish, and then when we have okay. our moments, we can. Do I get my time back? Yes. Go ahead. Thank he you. It. He paused it. I'm surprised you don't have a statue of Moloch in here. I really am. I'm going to ask the audience to refrain from laughing or, yes, thank you, or outbursts, please. Respectful. So this seems to be the basis of why you denounce people you disagree with. But you never defined the term the Chris, about Christian nationalism. You never define it. Do you, can you define it? So if you can't define it, that means you're cowards because you cannot define Christian nationalism. If you define it as people who love God, their neighbors, and their nation, we won't mind. Or if you define it literally as simply the opposite of satanic globalism, we won't mind. But because you won't define it and only use it to defame and marginalize us, we see you are guilty of religious bigotry. Here is how some have defined Christian nationalism, which we emphasize. I can never say that. Reject. Those who try to use the force of the state to convert people to Christianity. We don't do that. Those who condone violence in the name of conquering Satan. No. Believing God loves America more than other countries. No. Those who insist Donald Trump is a messianic figure. No. You use the term only as a religiously bigoted slur. Because of the dishonest way you choose to describe us, the term Christian nationalist has become offensive to us. Do not use it in the future without clearly describing what exactly 
you are referring to. In reality, who is not holding fast to the true meaning of the separation of church and state? President Jefferson's principle of a wall of separation between church and state is not violated but violated by a mayor going to a citywide church gathering. However, if civil government representatives abuse their power to denounce someone for going to a worship service, they most certainly are violating the principle of separation of church and state. How hypocritical. It seems there is a gross double standard to accuse one's opponent of violating the separation of church and state when they are not but you are actually violating the principle of separation of church and state is mind blowing. The double standard is such a terrible injustice. I think those who sponsored this resolution should denounce themselves. Thank you, your time is up. <sighs> All right, next up is Antoine, George Taylor, and then Gabe Blomgren. Hi, hi my name's Antoine. Okay, uh, you're talking about Christianity and uh, uh, faith, you know, and trust in God. Okay, what about Manifest Destiny when it came in 1830s? You know, was it God is integrity, you know? But where is integrity? You know, is it one or is it two? Is it personal or is it group? And I just want to say that I feel sorry for you guys. I feel for you guys the flack that you guys have to take from people because they sometimes... But they, like, like the first guy said, they call me a racist. And I'm going to tell you one thing. I agree with him. Racist, racism, fascism is in every color, is in every race. You need to get that. And it's in every religious denomination. Now, that's what, that's what we're dealing with here tonight. And I feel for you guys. Okay? I just want to let you know that we need to look within our group who is pushing us. Some of these people may be innocent, totally, just in ignorant, but need to look at who is leading you. And then, then you allow God rather than hate. If you are a true, if you are a true Christian, allow the God or whatever, the grace be whatever you want to call it, to come in and allow you to choose. That's something that's going to help you and your children and your community. Not with hate, but with love. That's what we need. We've lived in hate for so many years. And we're talking about things are changing. Believe me, things are changing. Decisions, choices are being made. Something to think about. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yes. George Taylor then Gabe Bloomgren, and then Mary. Mary. Wynn. City Council President Kinnear, you have been patient and long-suffering. I commend you for your leadership tonight to keep things calm and keep the lid on. This resolution I completely support. As a Christian pastor, I'm one of the pastors at All Saints Lutheran Church, in Brown's edition, I'm surprised that all the people from Spokane Valley who have appeared here to testify tonight about our fair city, they all of a sudden seem to be concerned about what's happening with our mayor and the citizens. Uh, they have their own mayor in Spokane Valley, and he's a problem too. But Point of order, that's a statement of fact. That's inaccurate. Okay. Thank you. This resolution, which I speak in favor of, would not condemn Fused or Shea, but mentions only Mayor Woodward. It has nothing to do with the issue of freedom of religion. Mayor Woodward is free to pray wherever she wants and whatever rally she goes to. She's free to do that. That's not the problem here. The problem is that she's mayor of our city, and as such, she should be held to a higher moral standard than the average uh, person, the average citizen. I am a Christian, and this resolution in no way 
condemns public prayer. I don't see any of that in the resolution, as some of these speakers have alleged. I have been in, uh, nor does the resolution uh, condemn believers as Fust, a self-ordained minister, he calls himself, now claims. By the way, Fust, who was on that platform with Woodward, heads up a nonprofit corporation which has taken in $1.5 million since all this happened. That's a fact. I hope you pass this resolution unanimously tonight to send a clear and strong message that hate is not welcome in Spokane, particularly from our elected leaders, whom we expect to set a high moral example. My mother taught me that she felt that I was guilty by association with some juvenile delinquents I was running with in junior high school. And she said, George, you will be known by the people you associate with. I'll tell you the fact, as I understand it from the press, I was not at the rally, but Mayor Woodward accepted putting the hands on, which is a, a, a sacred ritual in the Christian tradition. She, he laid his hands on her, and he blessed her, and he endorsed her as mayor. George, unfortunately, our time is up. Okay. Thank you. Um, Gabe, and then Mary, and then, oh, I can't read Jacoby's writing. Anthony? Anthony. Anthony, okay. Thank you, Council, for your time. I just want to say uh, thank you for being here so late. I do have to reiterate that it was your decision to do this, so it's kind of on you that it's going this late. I also know that you are pillars in our community, and I respect you for being guardians of this community. I've lived in this area for a very long time. I'm a 44-year-old grandfather. I have a beautiful wife. I proposed to her at Riverfront Park. My kids have all been on the slide. I've been to Boone Street Barn back when it existed, and I listened to Nadine Woodward tell me the news for many, many years. She's an amazing individual and an upstanding and classy woman. And the very fact that she did not take Matt's hand off of her shows the level of candor and respect for her fellow man. I believe her that when she said she did not know, my pastor Matt would not be there. I believe her. What's going on right now between all of us and I have to say, Zachary, I respect your position, and I have to say, Ms. Wil Ms. Wilkinson, you have the right to put this vote forth. Please direct your comments to I'm me. I'm sorry, Ms. Kinnear. Thank you. What we're doing is dividing an already polarized community. None of us want any of this to go any further. Your mayor back there right now just along with you, pours out her life into this community. This is going to do nothing but hurt us. But I do say this to you, even though you say it's not a political move, if you go forth with this, it will guarantee that Lisa Brown will not get voted in. Because the community is going to surround around this woman, who I, frankly, I don't agree with everything that she's done. But I know she's a believer of Jesus Christ. And she didn't know when somebody would be there. And I'm gonna invite you right now to a worship service. And you didn't know that I was gonna pray for you. She had no idea that anybody was gonna lay hands on her and pray on her. But she believes in Jesus Christ. And I believe right now we need grace. So right now I pray for every one of you on this council. In Jesus' name I declare this council is here for your glory, God. Jesus, I ask that this situation be brought for your glory, and I rebuke division in this city, God, and I ask for grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was 
once lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Thank you, and your time is up. Mary, then Anthony, and then James. Duncan. Hello, hello, City Council. Barry, from the Vietnamese community. Many of my friends are from the Vietnam veterans, the Filipino community, and the Vietnamese communities really strongly support and praise Mayor Journalist Nadine for her effort to keep Spokane great and safe, a happy place to live. Thanks to Mayor Nadine and some of you here do not support putting the toxic fluoride into Spokane water. We escaped a communist nation afraid of communism. Communism killed freedom and killed 100,000 million people. Suddenly, in many US cities, there is a godless communist cultural revolution, looting of business, churches, violent killing, criminals released from jails, historical statues destroyed, scary open borders for human trafficking, drug trafficking, violent crimes, and Washington is a border state. And we don't want any of that. We have a radical administration promoting abortion, killing babies, changing sex, mutilating of children, teaching racism in school. We don't want any of that. We thank you, Mayor Nadine, journalist Nadine, and everyone for help keeping Spokane safe and great. We are blessed Americans enjoying life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And USA is the greatest nation in God we trust. So we enjoy freedom, especially the freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Dear City Council, Pastor Matt Shea is our friend. He's a good man. He's a, he is a man of integrity. He is an anti-communist patriot. He is a military officer. He's a good friend, a man. I, he, he is a good Christian. So denouncing Mayor Nadine because of him is so, so wrong. It's ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony and then James. Who am I? My name is Anthony DeMauro. I'm a child of God and a devout Christ Catholic Christian. I'm the dust inside the hoof, the donkey that carries Christ. Humility is the principal point. I'm a Gonzaga student. At GU, we've seen a rise in discrimination and violence against traditionally minus students openly practicing their faith. This doesn't just mean Christians, but Muslims, Jews, and all faith practices. This is a trend throughout all colleges in the nation. Two weeks ago, the Catholic Diocese of Spokane hosted a procession, a beautiful holy hour of Eucharistic adoration with 20 plus first and second class relics, along with the actual spinner of the true cross of, that Jesus was crucified on, the bone of the Apostle Peter, St. Andrew the Apostle, and many other saints. This all occurred at the podium. How amazing is it that we had these relics here in our city? Wow. <laughs> Bishop Thomas Daly led over 2,500 Catholic Christians through the city of Spokane. We had a beautiful after event celebration where the Hispanic community danced and sang songs in honor of our shared Trinitarian God. I wonder if the same reaction would have occurred if Nadine stepped up and prayed during this adoration worship service, which occurred at the podium. What is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Eucharist is the summit and source of the Catholic Christian faith. We believe that Jesus is truly present, and the Eucharist is not just a symbol, but our actual God transubstantiated. We have seen a rise in vandalism against Catholic Christian churches in the nation. Churches have been burned, our sacred spaces have been inter interrupted by protesters, and our sacred images beheaded, graffitied, and disrespected by extremists. My church, the Cathedral of Our Lady of Lords, had loud protesters last year, which interrupted our most sacred ceremony, the Mass. Jesus in the Eucharist is in that church right now. I don't want this rhetoric to cause my church to be damaged. I fear there's a dangerous rhetoric being spread from the city council, which will lead to a further rise of religious persecutions and enable extremists to act on their violent tendencies against religious groups throughout the city. I support Mayor Nadine Woodward. She prayed on a stage and is being persecuted for it. I don't care who she was praying with. The demonization of Nadine and those at that worship service is wrong. 
I invite all those of my Protestant, Catholic, and Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters to please join me in praying the Our Father. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate Heart of Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. All you holy angels and saints, please pray for us. And I'll be praying for every one of you. Thank you for extending the time here. And your t- I just I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Uh, last but not least, James. Good evening again. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share one more time. Um, My name is James Duncan. I've been here 18 years, so I am a Spokenite, and I am a Christian. And I don't hide it. I don't lie about it. I don't deny it. I stand boldly because that's what I'm called to do. And I know people like this because I hang around with them and I live with them. But um, I I hear white nationalists and I hear homophobic or LGP, if I can't remember the letters, don't judge me, I can't. I, I, I guess I should learn them. Maybe I should challenge myself to do so. But um, I don't know a real Christian that is homophobic. I didn't see that at this event. You know, I, I didn't see Miss um, Mayor and Aideen and, and Matt Shea collaborating in some corner together. You know, I saw a woman being called up on the stage and people praying for, for her and him being there. And if she had the grace and classiness to not throw his hands off, I say good for her because I would have struggled with that. I probably would have done the same thing, but I know I would have struggled with that. Um, you guys are going to do what you're going to do tonight. And I see this turning into a legal battle. And um, right around, right around, Vote election time, it's, 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 it's hilarious to me. It really is. Um, I'm 57 years old. I'm no kid. I don't know everything, but I sure know some things when I see it. But um, I'm going to leave you with the scripture. I'm not going to take all my time. I don't see the need to do so. Um, maybe, it'll, maybe it'll work for me. Maybe it'll help you. I hope it does. Uh, Lamenta- Lamentations 340 states, let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's the end of public testimony. We are at um, 1019. We're going to need a motion to extend our time. Okay. Motion to extend to 11. I mean, we don't have to take all the time. Motion to extend. What were you going to say, Councilmember Stratton? Oh, I thought we were, we agreed on 1030. Was it 1015? It was 1030, but it is now oh, 1019. Okay. So we have There's going to be council comments. 20, yeah. yeah, and I know there's some people who are going to be commentating up here so uh what did you say 11 to extend to 11 yeah second okay all those in favor all right right thank you council president go ahead i would like to make a motion that the city council <clears throat> releases our attorney client privilege related to any and all legal documents associated with denouncing or censuring resolutions second discussion what does that mean means they would all be publicly available to be viewed by the public. What would be, uh, I mean, I guess I'm struggling. What would be, uh, is there anything out there that should be available? I mean. Well, we have multiple legal analyses from our legal department, and this would effectively make those available to the public for review. Specific to this resolution in and of itself. Okay. Uh, Comment. Actually, we didn't get a any legal advice on this resolution. We got it on a censure, and this is a denouncement. I did. Oh, so we can make it available. So were you the only one? I don't know. Oh. Uh, we've had this problem before with legal not providing all of council advice on things. So that's frustrating that legal wouldn't be sharing with everyone. I, I think that's a, a splitting hair situation because denouncement and censure, the advice that we would be getting from City legal would be very similar on the statement that we're making, and um, so I just I I wouldn't say that it's I would say that's an unfair statement to our city legal team. Okay. Well, 
based on my conversations with legal, which is what I've been told to say, instead of saying what they recommend, just say, based on my conversations, I've come to the conclusion that they do mean something different. My information says otherwise. Sounds like city legal has giving different information. Well, there's an easy way to clear it up. Do, who else, anybody else want to comment? Uh, I would just say that's pretty uh, rare for us to release that information. It is rare for us, but in the spirit of transparency, mm -hmm. I don't see that there's a problem, unless somebody, I, either of you? I don't have a problem with it. Okay. I mean, the, the rationale is usually then that opens the door to litigation, right? Good. Yeah, good. Right, so then. But we get sued all the time, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I would also open the door to potential other legal advice from the community, which would, could, could look at how our legal advice is provided to us, and they could criticize that legal advice. They could, but that's a stretch, I think. Go ahead. I, I don't think that's a stretch. I think other lawyers might say, wow, you guys are getting some pretty interesting legal advice. I, I like to uh, have our policy director, Chris Wright, kind of weigh in on legally where we stand, if that was confidential information sent out by legal. They don't know we're having this discussion. Um, it's kind of like, I, I'm concerned. And remember, there's a microphone there, Mr. Wright. Yeah. You need to speak. <laughs> there you go. Gotcha. Um, I do recommend that you wait to hear from legal before you take this action um, so that you know their view of this motion. Um, we know in the past that um, it takes a majority vote of the council to release that information. I think council members of Pone's point that they haven't really weighed in on this or this particular resolution or draft. If they have, it's been since, uh, what, 4.43 this afternoon, uh, and I haven't seen it. I, I recommend you wait, um, but the only guidance you have, you know, the only rule you have is that it takes a majority vote. Question. Hold on, go ahead. Actually, I think it's six votes to release legal. Um, it may be. Uh, yeah. but, uh, I will just in full transparency, both our current city attorney as well as our previous city attorney have emphatically said that they will never at any point in time support releasing any legal documents for any purpose, for any reason. I'm just very pro-transparency and I think we should do it. Go ahead. Um, wouldn't it require suspension of the rules to add this motion? This was not circulated before today's. I think the bar is high enough, it wouldn't matter. But let's hear from Mr. Wright. I think so, yes. <clears throat> I have an alternative thought. Um, could we, because I don't, you're, the last um, version of this we got was at four o'clock, so I haven't heard anything from legal. Could we wait on that and, and talk to legal and then maybe on Thursday do a special meeting to support I, it? I think council can, can do anything we want, but I will just tell you, I don't think legal is gonna give you an opinion that they will advise releasing that information. I'll just say that right now. Well, I'd like to see what we, I, I think none of us have talked to legal. That, mm -hmm. that concerns me. I'd like to talk to them directly. Yeah. Before. I, I have no problem if we decide that we want to, uh, you know, if we have not all, in fact, seen the same legal advice, wait until we all have and then we can make a decision at that time, I would, I would support that action. Okay. All right. While so, I think it would be good to release yes. this information, yep. Let's wait till we all have the same information. I so agree. So you made a motion, you seconded it. Yes. We had our discussion. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. 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 All right. So the nays have it. So all, can I go? Can you go? Follow up my commentary. Yes. Uh, I was hoping that we could start. But... Oh, go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. I'll be very brief. Uh, so first off, our legal department has said that this is not the proper vehicle for this. Point time. of view, point of order. Uh, Council member Cathcart is stating what legal has stated, which is executive privilege. Without details of why. But the recommendation is to say based on those conversations, not what they have said. There is a difference. No, that's not true. Our legal department has said that this isn't the right vehicle. I'm not leaving it there. Point, point of order, okay. Council President. Yes. This is uh, we're the client. Why don't you want this information to be on the one public? individual is stating what that attorney client privilege has stated, which is a violation of our rules. 
Okay, I will not further talk about what legal has said, but you all get the gist. Um, <laughs> and frankly, this is the second time, so this, is, this has some constitutional, uh, obviously, potential issues related to it. And this is the second time that we have, well, perhaps more than that, but blatant direct times where we have to kind of potentially cross the line. And the last time, the most blatant one was where we asked this mayor to give her, basically told her that she should remove a sitting city council person from this building. The same mayor that we are denouncing right now through this action, we wanted just a short time ago to have the power to actually remove sitting city council members from this building. So I will just make that note right up the front. Um, second thing I just wanna make clear, uh, I'm a Christian, I'm a proud Christian, and it doesn't have any bearing on my views on this issue, but I also wanna make sure it's very clear, since there are some out there who seem to like to twist things and forget history, um, that I issued a very strong statement in August of 2019 about Matt Shea, condemning his actions. I stand by it, I've never stopped standing by it, so I don't need to even reaffirm it, because it's still fact. Um, and those comments were prominently displayed in the evening news multiple times. I'm also grateful that the mayor has clarified her views and her statements and her actions. I think that's important, and I'm appreciative that she's done that. And now I think we should stop giving Matt Shea a platform to raise a million and a half dollars and move on to other things. Who would like to go next? Go ahead. I'll go. So, so thank everyone for coming down tonight. I just want to say we must be willing to experience some personal discomfort when dearly held beliefs are challenged, especially when these beliefs translate into actions that might harm our neighbors. I am a daughter of two pastors and now grandmother of three. I cannot stand by as the mayor of our city stands with a man who used religion to cloak bigotry. Former Representative Matt Shea is not only accused of calling for the violent overthrow of the United States government on multiple occasions, but before calling the mayor up on stage, he criticized homosexuality and marriage, which was approved by the voters of Washington in 2012. Shea also spewed anti-trans language on stage and call for a fire. And I understand what the one speaker said about the fire. Holy Ghost fire, absolutely. Spokane, while hundreds of our neighbors, the challenge is not everybody understands that and understands the Bible and religion like we do. So we have to be clear about that. This issue is not about condemning it is about condemning hate and not about freedom. I took an oath, everybody's called out, we've all taken an oath, and me as your council member, and it's my constitutional duty to uphold the values of respect, inclusivity, and compassion. This includes condemning when leaders stand shoulder to shoulder with those that call for harm upon our neighbors. As the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, he's very prominent tonight, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. I tell you now, my friends, I will not be silent when extremism shows up in our city because hate is not welcome. And for all the commentary around, uh, I am doing a political hit job I didn't schedule the event. Who knew that was coming? So that narrative is all twisted. This was brought forward because people from our community came to us and wanted us to say something. You all have had the opportunity to speak and I respect everything you said, but you don't see the other side of all the other citizens of Spokane who have contacted this council that has some fear and concerns about what's going on in our community. So, like the mayor, I have to represent everybody, and everybody's voice needs to be heard. <coughs> we have heard yours tonight, and we have heard from our other citizens. And like I have shared with some of the others, we'll have to vote our own lived experience 
in our own conscience on this tonight. Go ahead. Yeah, Jacoby, I have some slides if you can put them up. So I want to provide some um, history to the events here and set some misinformation that's been said tonight uh, and, and get that information clear. So we're talking about a denouncement. Denounce simply means to publicly declare wrong. So this isn't an, uh, a proclamation or a resolution that denounces specifically, I'll read it word for word, a resolution formally denouncing Mayor Nadine Woodward's actions that affiliated the city of Spokane and its residents with former Washington State Representative and identified domestic terrorist Matt Shea and known anti-LGBTQ extremist Sean Foy. So I think we can all agree that no one in Spokane should feel excluded, targeted, disrespected, or hated because of who you are. We, are, we all value living in a place that strives to be community in which everyone feels that they belong. We as council members should take our oaths of office seriously and maintain a strong adherence to democracy. We must take a moral stand and show leadership when anything threatens our community and makes our community members feel unsafe or threatens the very nature of democracy itself. Elected officials have a moral obligation to speak out when we see wrongdoing. <laughs> Mayor Woodward's public appearance was wrong, plain, and simple. It affiliated the city of Spokane and its residents with extremists. Jacoby, can you go to the next slide? Here's the report from 2019 about what Matt Shea did in his uh, acts of or identifying with his acts of terrorism. So it's very concerning for many reasons. Former Representative Shea has been accused of committing acts of domestic terrorism. An independent investigation commissioned by the Washington State House of Representatives found that, quote, Matt, Representative Shea, as a leader in the Patriot Movement, planned, engaged in, and promoted a total of three armed conflicts of political violence against the United States government in three states outside of the state of Washington over a three-year period. This independent investigation found that Shea, quote, has also used fear to intimidate those who directly oppose him politically. And Shea and the Patriot Movement, quote, rely on radicalization of individuals to the point they're willing to take up arms against the United States to carry out their objectives. Former Representative Matt Shea also distributed a manifesto titled The Biblical Basis for War, in which he advocates to replace democracy with Christian theocracy and states, quote, if they do not yield, kill all males. Former Sheriff Ozzie Knezovich has called the Shea's manifesto a manual consistent with the ideology and operating philosophy of the Aryan nations. And furthermore, in 2019, Matt Shea was reported to purchase GPS and other technology to spy on progressive left officials. And it's clear that Matt Shea is not preaching Christianity. He is promoting an extremism ideology. He was kicked out of the Republican caucus for his extremism. Additionally, as was stated before, moments before calling the mayor on stage, moments before calling the mayor on stage, Shea stated his view that gay marriage and transgender issues were threats to our country, equivalent to wildfires. The mayor has condemned Shea previously and claimed she did not know he would be made there, which Shea disputes. Why wouldn't the mayor leave after hearing Shea make these comments? This appearance by Mayor Woodward shows that she's comfortable with these opinions and this type of behavior. I actually don't believe that she was there because of him, or she knew he was gonna be there before the event happened. I believe that. However, she was on the stage before, or he was on the stage before she walked out. He called her and invited her onto the stage. She listened to his hateful rhetoric against the LGBTQ community. She could have walked away, but she never even thought about it. And to signal to extremists that this behavior is acceptable. In fact, Matt Shea is now using her image on his social media, if you go to the next one. So Matt Shea is using her image on the social media. This normalizes him and adds legitimacy to him and his extremism. This is a concern. The council must be clear that we serve all citizens of our community, regardless of race, religion, color, and sexual identity. And we will never accept ideologies that promote fear, hatred, violence, and bigotry. We will not condone this appearance with an accused domestic terrorist. We will not condone any hate to any group in our city. Some argue, as we've heard tonight, that this is an attack on religious freedom. Let's be clear. This is not about religion. 
the resolution says Christian nationalists once, and that is quoting a letter from a group of, um, from the faith community of faith leaders. Uh, you go to the next one, Jacoby. Uh, this is not religion. It's a denouncement that does not stop someone from being able to exercise their right. Nothing in this resolution prohibits someone from being able to exercise their right to religion. You can still do it. We also need to be clear, Sean Foy is a self-described Christian nationalist. Christian nationalism. Okay. I am going to clear this chambers if we're, there's one more outburst. So, and we have security who will do it. So Christian nationalism, nationalism is wanting to create laws based on Christianity for Christianity to make this a country of Christians, which would actually violate our Constitution, which prohibits us from doing that. Uh, that is why we added a section to this resolution that says we support the separation of church and state, supporting religious freedom. So that is now in this resolution that we believe in the separation of church and state. We support people's right to practice religion. And as stated earlier, dozens and dozens of religious leaders have stated that this is bigotry cloaked in religion. And you can go to the, the next slide, Jacoby. So there was warnings from religious leaders around the Pacific Northwest about Sean Foyt's um, tour before he came to, the, to our states. And since then, we've had leaders that have spoken out here locally. Uh, the mayor has argued that she has already apologized, so we just need to move on. Unfortunately, the legislative process is slow, and we're just following regular process. It takes weeks to pass anything here, and this is the only way for us to speak as a body. But during the, that time, the mayor has changed her reasoning for appearing at the event. Jacoby, if you can go to the next slide. So on August 21st, the mayor said, quote, thousands of citizens who joined together yesterday, to, uh, that she was there with thousands of citizens, who joined yesterday to, to pray for fire victims and first responders. I attended that event with one purpose only, and that was to join with fellow citizens to begin the healing process. Then Matt Shea pointed out that that wasn't true, and something changed, and her comments changed. Can you go to the next slide? On September 8th, and when asked in an interview if she ever thought about leaving the stage, the mayor said, no, she didn't ever think about leaving the stage. She was there to pray for the city. That was the primary reason. No longer about the fire victims. It's now just praying for the city. What changed? Revealing the truth. It would have been different if the mayor had owned the mistake and said she learned from it. We all do make mistakes. But instead, the mayor has been intentionally misleading us about this and reinventing the history. Some say that this distracts, distracts from other issues and creates more division in our community. Um, however, hate crimes are occurring in our city right now. Jacoby, if you can go to the next one. These hate crimes are occurring, and the mayor has been silent. This is not a hate crime, but there are others. So during Pride and Perry earlier this year, a group of neo-Nazis showed up to intimidate our community. I was there with my boyfriend and his two kids, and we walked by these folks who were there to intimidate us. I actually had to speak publicly and stand up out in the street corner and worry for my own safety if I was going to be OK. Um, last year, over 30 white supremacists were caught in a U-Haul in Coeur d'Alene and were planning a riot and have been prosecuted for that at the Coeur d'Alene Pride Festival. Jacoby, if you could go to the next one. A couple weeks ago, there was a hate crime at Odyssey Youth Center and the Rainbow Crosswalk, intentionally targeting the LGBTQ community. So as a member of that community, I feel the fear that so many others in our community feel. So not only has the mayor been silent on these hate crimes in our community, never once commenting about these, but she stood on stage and accepted support from known anti-LGBTQ figures. She's on social media making posts that blame the budget deficit on rainbow crosswalks and shadow governments. She has previously called people names online, too. This extremist language only embo emboldens extremists in the community and encourages them to come to Spokane. We, as elected leaders, have to say that this behavior is wrong. We have to stand up for our civil rights and democracy. We have to say that this language, this rhetoric, promoting extremism and legitimizing extremism is not acceptable. 
This resolution of denouncement is our way to do this. It is a formal and public statement that we believe her actions were wrong. That's all it's saying. You, this was wrong. And it affiliated the city of Spokane with extremists. extremists. It appeared in national news. People around the country and the world think of Spokane and think of extremism, and this was part of it. This resolution is the only way that we as a legislative body can collectively make a statement. A denouncement is a tool used by legislative bodies to formally disapprove of actions by fellow elected officials. It is unfortunate that we've been put in a position to make the statement, but we have been left no choice. The situation has led to division in our community, negative national news coverage, countless emails and phone calls, talk at neighborhood council meetings, and we've even received a letter from dozens of faith leaders in the community calling on us to make a statement. So I look forward to moving past this and continuing to work to make Spokane a place where we all belong. Thank you. Who wants to go? Go ahead. So I just have a few points I want to make. First, um, thank you everybody for hanging in there with us. It was important that we listen to people. Um, the first thing I'll say is that I was born and raised Catholic. I walk around with invisible nuns on my shoulder 98% of the time. Um, but that's really nobody's business. And um, I believe that religion is personal. And I support the freedom to worship. Mm -hmm. I pray. Mm -hmm. I believe in God. I believe in, in what I was taught, 12 years of Catholic schools. But it crosses the line for me when publicly these events that we see happening more often than ever promote fear for certain members of our community and hatred. Then it's not OK to me as a person. The one thing I wanted to say is that the mayor showed up as the mayor. I think somebody said she showed up as Nadine Woodward. She showed up as the mayor. And this is my big point, is that elected officials are, are held to a higher standard. There are people that I represent in my district, they don't care if I go to mass. They don't care who I voted for president. They care that I represent them and that I take their comments and their concerns before this body and we talk about it and we try and find some solutions. That's what's important to me in municipal government. Religion, worship ceremonies, Matt Shea, all of that, it's not gonna help my residents in West Central. Trust me, they, they don't look for that, for the answers. They look to me and I have to rise above some of this as an elected official. Um, somebody said earlier that, you know, Christians take somebody and talk, take the enemy and they feed the enemy and they talk to the enemy. And all I could think about after all of this information that's come out is what if your enemy is transgender or what if your enemy is gay? Um, does that mean that they can't sit at the same table with you? Because that's the message that's out there because of Matt Shea and Sean, whatever his last name is. So um, the other thing I want to say, and I'm not going to use any names, but um, a while ago in my professional career, I worked for um, somebody who was very, very important to me, who went through a very hard time as far as community and judgment and um, people inflicting all sorts of um, attitude and opinions on him. And he had this in his office, and I've never, ever um, forgotten it, and I've kind of um, structured my political and my um, public service around this. And it was written by uh, Martin Niemöller, um, who was a German theolo the theologian and a Lutheran pastor. He lived from 1892 to 1984. He was best known for his opposition of the Nazi regime during the late 1930s. And here's what he said. First, they came for the communists, and I did not speak out, because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out, because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unions, and I did not speak out, because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out. So I would like to put this behind us, 
but I do want to make the statement I'm answering to my constituents in my district who have sent me hundreds of emails and phone calls that were offended, that do not feel safe in this community, and pleading that as public servants, we rise above it and we can't put ourselves in situations that put fear in the people we're supposed to be serving. So thank you all. I know we're gonna agree to disagree. I hope this can be peaceful. But um, I think that I want to speak out. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Or uh, council member. Thank you. I'm not used to you being a council member, so. I know. So uh, I'm a former pastor, uh, but more importantly, I'm a proud Bible quiz kid, and I have read uh, the good book from cover to cover. Uh, I've entirely memorized word for word the books of Matthew, Acts, and Romans. Um, so I think I can speak with some authority that uh, Matt Shea, Sean Fuchs, do not speak for the Jesus that I know. And I, I hope that is clear. Um, I have heard from good friends on both sides. Um, I'm new here. And the last thing I want to do is denounce anyone. But I want to make sure that every member of our community has space in Spokane. And I did appreciate, I watched Mayor Woodward's uh, interview several times. I appreciate that Mayor Woodward acknowledged that mistakes were made. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes. And mistakes do have consequences. And I think my colleague here has demonstrated some of the consequences that have occurred because of that mistake. Uh, the division that we've seen in our community now is a consequence of that mistake. So I absolutely denounce Matt Shea and Sean Fuchs and the division and discrimination and hate that comes along with that thinking. Uh, but where I have to stop today is that we have heard from our council uh, advice. Um, apparently there is other uh, legal opinions that I think council needs to hear as good stewards. I am new, uh, so I'm forgetting all of the different procedures, but I am not comfortable voting on this until I have heard from all legal counsel. Uh, Can I make a motion to defer? Not yet. Um, let's hear from uh, Councilmember Bingle, sorry. It's been a long night. It has, it has been, yeah. I do appreciate everybody up here sitting through this. You know, I think you do the city a favor uh, by, by doing your duty and, and listening to the people here. I appreciate every one of you for that. I've, I've heard a number of things. I have a lot of um, issues with this resolution for a number of reasons. I do want to speak from a little lived experience, if I could. Uh, I am a person who's been censured by this body. And uh, less than a month into my tenure, I was censured because I refused to wear a mask here. And uh, in that moment, I have you know, evidence of several moments where every council member on this body was also not doing the same thing. I just chose to be honest about it. And what ended up happening is I was censured again a month in. And I understand when people say mistakes have consequences. And I totally agree. I think there's a caveat to that. Mistakes have consequences when you are the political minority. Plenty of mistakes have been made by this body that have not resulted in the same action. I don't believe we're consistent in this, and that's why I believe it's a nakedly political move. And when we talk about, you know, the process doesn't move quickly, we just showed today that we can suspend the rules, put an ordinance on, an emergency ordinance, and pass it. Um, the vehicle exists, and we do it regularly. Right, And so it's not something that is foreign to us, something that wouldn't normally happen uh, by this body. And so, sure, things don't always move quickly, but they absolutely can. And we saw that a number of times, uh, be it a uh, moratorium on development. Uh, you know, there's, there's a number of examples that we have absolutely done that. When it comes to denouncing hatred and those kinds of things, totally understand it, and I appreciate that. Um, when I was censured, um, I received uh, many death threats myself, um, one of them being so disturbing, I will never forget it, but they said, I hope your kid gets COVID and dies. 
And when I shared that with my council members, I don't remember a statement being made to say this is hateful language and it shouldn't happen. It didn't happen then. When the person whose seat I replaced was sharing social media posts about how all cops are bastards, creating a tense situation for our law enforcement officers, I don't remember us as a body making a strong statement denouncing hate when it comes to the people who serve our city. Um, and I agree that no one should feel excluded for who you are, but many times this body um, has shown that to be um, our way of life when we don't agree with them. When it comes to uh, the mayor's statement changing from praying for the fires and praying for the city, I don't see that's a, a, a changing uh, statement. But uh, I just, I have a lot of questions on this resolution when it comes to the resolution itself. When we say known anti-LGBTQ extremist John Foyt, um, I think that we could be um, in trouble for uh, defamatory statements. I think that uh, if I were a uh, member traveling and uh, worshiping like that and I went into a city, which I have in the past, I have traveled and worship. I was a worship minister myself for a number of years. If their city council then said known anti-LGBTQ extremist Jonathan Bingle, I would sue the pants off of them so quickly. Um, it was brought up here when it says that a fire would consume Spokane. This is uh, when we talk about our religion. It's not a literal fire. Our God is described as an all-consuming fire in Hebrews 12. Um, and so for us to say about this after it's been described to us, and I have described that to us as a council, to keep it in there is, again, possibly culturally illiterate, but, uh, but dishonest. When it says we do not condone hateful and dangerous behavior and beliefs, I do have lots of questions, and I think this is where it comes into play, where we talk about in Spokane, we all belong, right? Well, not really. I mean, there's two people pretty specifically in this that we're saying don't belong in the city of Spokane. Um, but I think it extends beyond that because it says that be it also resolved, we'll never accept ideologies that promote fear, hatred, violence, or bigotry. The trouble with this language is that we don't define what is an ideology that promotes fear, hatred, violence, and bigotry? The reason why we say he's a known anti-LGBTQ extremist is because of the statements that were put up there. He doesn't think that we should mutilate children, a statement I agree with. If that makes them an anti-LGBTQ extremist, then that would condemn me as well. And many who have sincerely held religious beliefs that are not new, beliefs that Barack Obama, when running for president in 2008, espoused himself, these are things that are sincerely held religious beliefs. And so when you condemn ideologies that promote bigotry, this is why so many Christians are here today to wonder about, am I welcome in the city of Spokane? And I understand what you're saying about condemning hatred. My problem with this has always been that I believe that we are being hypocritical in our statements, hypocritical in our beliefs, that we are doing the very thing that we're asking others not to do. That is a huge problem for me. And... Um, Again, going back to this being a political statement, which it obviously is. You know, you can fact check the speaker who says, you know, this is all on behalf of Lisa Brown, but it's, it's pretty clearly a political move as we could have moved quicker. Four separate statements were made by people on this council. Um, many on this uh, council have agreed. People have said their piece, it's time to move on. Yet this is here again, and it's because there is an election coming up. And I believe that that is uh, the reason why we continue to drag this out. And I don't believe this is the end of it even here. I think we'll continue to talk about this in the media and those kinds of things. When we're talking about leaders and should they leave as soon as they know that there are, you know, alleged domestic terrorists. Somebody else brought it up tonight that uh, a, a, since this is germane to the conversation, another candidate running for mayor was at an event with a convicted domestic terrorist. So if we are going to denounce people for that standard, then I would also ask my body to denounce others who associate with like individuals, because that would be consistent. I would ask Commissioners Waldruff and Jordan to denounce um, a candidate for associating with convicted, not alleged, convicted domestic terrorists. I would encourage all who made those statements to do the same thing. I have a feeling that won't happen. You're done. Okay. I, I am, yes. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Orlick, you had a motion. Do you want to go ahead now with it? Yes. Can I make a motion to defer? Yes, you can. So I would like to make a motion to okay, defer. Okay, good. <laughs> and now 
uh, we would need a second term. to what By date? Term. Oh yeah, one week. One week. So a week from Today. October second or whatever it is. Okay. Uh, do we have a second so we can discuss? I'll second it for discussion. All right. Let's have the discussion. So are we deferring for one week for to get feedback from legal? Is that the whole purpose of this deferral? Yes, I would like to hear what our colleagues have also heard from legal. Go ahead. I uh, just get concerned that we'll rehash this whole conversation again in a week. And I don't, I think if legal have major concerns, they have come to all of council before when they have major concerns. They have also done this previously where they pit us against each other when they're trying to get something scored through. So I don't think that's not a major concern of mine. Uh, go ahead. I, I think that's a disrespectful statement to city legal, but um, I also think that um, I understand your reasoning. Um, and, uh, but what I do think is, I think that does exactly what, what I've been talking about is it continues to drag it out. Let's vote on this thing and be done. Okay. Anybody else commenting on this? Did you have your hand up? All right. No. All those who are in favor of deferring, say aye. Aye. Right. Party of one. Um, and against, nay. 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 All right. But thanks for trying. Okay. I'm going to make some statements. Do you think you could throw up that um, slideshow again with the rampart? Um, the slide with the... the uh, Legislative. No, it's just email to you, Jacoby. I know. I'll be quick. I know we have to adjourn pretty soon. You You're buying minutes. dinner. <laughs> I'm buying dinner. You might want to ask for a motion can to we, extend for 10 minutes. Can we extend minutes. for 10 minutes? So moved. Second. All right. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Uh, keep going. Oh, go back. Let's go back. Oh All right, there we are. Um, I was part of this investigation because I am the only council member up here that was being under surveillance by Matt Shea. And I didn't know that. I had to have council or Sheriff Ozzie tell me that. And it was not only a surprise, but it scared the living bejesus out of me, quite frankly, because I wasn't as afraid of him as I was of his followers. So the people that think that he is... Uh, right and moral and good, um, I was afraid for my life. And that was in 2019. I, had, I was questioned by the investigator for the state legislature and the FBI. And that was further frightening, quite frankly. So this is personal for me. It's not about prayer. I grew up as a Catholic. I was told as a Catholic that Catholics are not true Christians. So, and Karen, I don't know if that ever happened to you, but that was, that was how we grew up, that we were odd, that we were outsiders because we were Catholic. In any case, uh, I was on record as being on the fence or perhaps not supporting this, but I came to realize that um, it, it wasn't as much about the mayor as it is about Matt Shea and about the people who are promoting that agenda. Um, and as... Someone up here said, um, the, the mistakes we made do have consequences. And that is a consequence. And you have to live with that. So um, I look at that and I think it kind of brought it all back to the head for me. That this is, this is not a person that we should ignore. And as Councilmember Cathcart said, yep, it is bringing more attention to what he, is, what he wants to do here. Um, yeah, but then if we don't speak out, are we complicit in he's still going to do that? So I was torn. I think at this point, however, I want to put this to rest. I've made my statement, um, but as a group, we need to coalesce and move on. So prepare to vote. <laughs> <laughs>